Okay. I think we've got this. Thank you all so much for your patience as we figured out all of these technical difficulties. Who knew that two months into this and for our last virtual reading for a while would be this much of a hassle and all of these obstacles. Um, but in the true spirit of theater and storytelling and that age old adage, the show must go on. Here we are. Hi everyone, I'm Ann Mason. I am the founder and producing artistic director of Relative Theatrics. Um, I wanna give a quick shout out to the folks at Reading Greek Tragedy out, um, Reading Greek, <laughs> Reading Greek Tragedy Online um, from the Center of Hellenic Studies, Out of Chaos Theater, Paul O'Mahony who really brought all of this to us and the Cosmos Society that has provided us with this fantastic translation of Ajax by Sophocles tonight. So tonight we will have a short reading, well, short, about a 90 minute reading of the play. Um, and then we'll have a couple people join us, including Dr. Laura Deloja to lead a discussion about this. Um, we are offering this evening's program for free. However, if you have the means, um, we would greatly appreciate it if you could pitch in and contribute to help support and pay all of the phenomenal artists that you are about to see. So many people have put in their time and efforts to bring this story to you. Um, and you are watching us now on Facebook, but I, we're planning on making this video available elsewhere. So um, feel free to connect with us online. You can go to our website, relativetheatrics.com, follow us on show, social media, sign up for our mailing list. Um, and I think that at this point, we should just get the show started. So um, I would like to invite all of the actors to our virtual stage at this point in time. That, that was smooth, Claire. <laughs> this is a little, actors, this is a little bit out of order from what we rehearsed, but let's have all of you introduce yourselves right now, the character you're playing and the character description from that list on the dramatis persona of Ajax by Sophocles. All right, hi, I'm Ailey and I will be playing Athena, goddess of war and wisdom. Hello, uh, my name is Francesca Mintovchiz, and I will be playing Odysseus, King of Ithaca, a leader in the Argive forces at Troy. Hello, my name is Noelia Burkis, and I am playing Ajax, King of Salamis, a leading Argive warrior leader. Hi, I'm Claire and Anne, and we will be playing the chorus, sailors from Salamis, followers of Ajax. Hi, my name is Issa, and I'm going to be playing Tech Mesa, a concubine of Ajax. Hi, I am Corinne Landy, and I am playing the messenger in Argive Soldier. Hi, I'm Alex, and I will be playing Tucer, an Argive warrior leader, half brother of Ajax. Hi, I'm Danny, and I will be playing Menelaus, one of the commanders of the Argive forces at Troy. Hi, my name is Jay, and I'm going to be playing Agamemnon, brother of Menelaus, commander of the Argive army. We also have, there are a few characters that are not seen. There's Eurysasis, who is the young son of Ajax and Tecmessa, as well as attendant servants and soldiers. And with that, a quick introductory note. When Achilles, the finest of all the warriors in the Achaean army at Troy, was killed, there was a dispute about which warrior should receive the high honor of getting Achilles' weapons. There were two main claimants, Odysseus and Ajax. The latter was, according to Homer, the finest warrior in the army after Achilles. However, as a result of voting among the leading warriors, the weapons were awarded to Odysseus. The action of Sophocles' play takes place the day after this decision and a note that Sophocles calls the Greek forces, the Argives, Achaeans, or Danaeans, as in Homer, and occasionally the Hellenes, or the Greeks. And with that, we will begin with Ajax by Sophocles, translated by Ian Johnston. The action takes place during the last year of the Trojan War. The scene is one end of the Argive camp beside the sea, outside Ajax's hut. The hut is a substantial building with main doors facing the audience and some side doors. There are steps leading up to a platform outside the main doors. 
It is early in the morning without very much light. Odysseus enters slowly, tracking footprints in the sand and trying to look through the partially open door into the hut. The goddess Athena appears and speaks to Odysseus. Odysseus, I keep seeing you prowl around seeking by stealth to gain the upper hand against your enemies. And now by these huts at the end of the army where Ajax has his camp beside the ships, for some time I've been observing you as you track him down. Keep your eyes fixed on his fresh made trail to find out whether he's inside or not. Like a keen nosed dog, Spartan hunts, like a keen nosed Spartan hunting dog, your path is taking you straight to your goal. The man has just gone in, his head and arms dripping with sweat after the butchery he's just carried out with his own sword. So you don't need to peer inside the doors. What are you so eager to discover here? Why not tell me? You could learn the answer from someone who knows. Uh, Athena's voice. Of all the gods, the one I cherish most. How clear you sound. I cannot see you, but I hear your words. My mind can grasp their sense, like the bronze call of an Etruscan trumpet. And you are right. You see me circling around, tracking down that man who hates me, shield-bearing Ajax. I've been following his trail a long time now, just him, no one else. During the night, he's done something inconceivable to us, if he's the one who did it. We're not sure. We don't know anything for certain. So I volunteered to find out what's gone on. We're just discovered all our livestock killed, our plunder butchered by some human hand, and with them too, the men who guard the herd. Everyone blames Ajax for the slaughter. What's more, an eyewitness who saw him striding by himself across the plain, his sword dripping with fresh blood, informed me of it and told me what he saw. I ran off at once to pick up his trail. I'm following the tracks, but it's confusing. Sometimes I don't know whose prints they are. So you've come just in time. For in the past and in the days to come, your hand has been and will remain my guide. I am aware of that, Odysseus. That's why for some time I've been keen to come to you as a watchman on your hunt. Well then, dear lady, will what I'm doing here have good results? I'll tell you this. Ajax did those killings as you suspected. Why would he do that? Why turn his hands to such a senseless act? The weapons, that armor from Achilles, it made him insanely angry. But then why would he slaughter all the animals? He thought he was staining both his hands with the blood from you. You mean this was his plan against the Argives? Yes, and it would have worked if I had not been paying attention. How could he have done something so reckless? How could his mind have been so rash? At night, in secret, he crept alone, looking for you. How close was he? Did he get his target? He reached the camp of both commanders. He made it right up to their double gates. If he was so insanely keen for slaughter, how could he prevent his hands from killing? I stopped him. I threw down into his eyes an overwhelming sense of murderous joy and turned his rage against the, sh the sheep and cattle and those protecting him, the common herd, which so far has not been divided up. He launched his attack against those animals and kept on chopping down and slaughtering the ones with horns by slicing through their spines until they made a circle all around him. At one point, at one point he thought he was butchering both sons of Atreus. He had them in his hands. Then he went at some other general and then another. As he charged around in his sick frenzy, I kept encouraging him, kept pushing him into those fatal nets. And then when he took a rest from killing, he tied up the sheep and cattle still alive and led them home as if he had captured human prisoners and not just animals. 
Now he keeps them tied up in his hut and tortures them. I'll let you see his madness in plain view here so you can witness it and report it to the archives. Be brave. Do not back off or look upon this man as any threat to you. I will avert his eyes so he will never see your face. Mm. You there, the one who's trying up his prisoner's arms, I'm calling you, I'm shouting now for Ajax. Come on out here, outside the hut in front. Athena, what are you doing? Don't call him, don't bring him out here. Just be patient. Don't run the risk of being called a coward. For the God's sake, don't do it. Leave him be. Let him stay inside. What's the matter with you? He was just a man before this, wasn't he? Yes. And in the past, he was no friend of mine, especially now. But the sweetest laughter comes from mocking enemies. Is that not true? Still. I'd much prefer he stayed inside the hut. You hesitate to see before your eyes someone in a raving fit? Yes, I do. If he were fully sane, I'd not avoid him or hesitate. But he won't see you now, not even if you stand beside him. How will that happen, if he can still see with his own eyes? His eyes see very well, but I will make them dark. Well... It is true, a god's work can make all things possible. Stand here, then, and stay quiet. I'd better stay, although I'd have preferred to keep my distance. You in there, Ajax, I'm calling you again. Why show your allies so much disrespect? Ajax enters from the hut. He is carrying a bloody whip with which he has been lashing the cattle inside his hut. Welcome, Athena. Welcome, child of Zeus. You have given me so much assistance. In gratitude for those I've captured, I'll offer you a crown, pure presence of pure gold. That's nobly spoken. But tell me this. Did that sword of yours slake itself on blood when you attacked the Argive army? Yes. That I can boast about, I don't deny it. You went after the two sons of Atreus with weapons in your fist. Indeed I did. They'll not dishonor Ajax anymore. So, as I understand you, those men are dead. Yes, dead. Let them rob me of my weapons now. I see. Well, well what about Laertes' son? As far as you're concerned, where does he stand? Did he escape? you. That damn slimy fox. You ask me where he is? Yes, I'm asking. I mean that enemy of yours, Odysseus. My favorite prisoner, lady, sits inside. I don't want him to die just yet. But when? What further actions do you have to do? And what advantage will you gain by that? Not before he's tied up to a pillar, the main one holding up the roof in there. What harm will you inflict on the poor man? I'll whip his back, blood red. Then I'll kill him. Don't abuse your poor man so viciously. You can follow your desires, Athena, in all other things. That I will concede. But this is the price he's going to pay, not something else. All right. Since it pleases you, give that arm of yours some exercise. Don't stop. Do what you've planned. Then I'll get back to work. And I'll leave you with this request from me. Always stand beside me as an ally, the way you did today. Ajax goes back into the hut. Do you see, Odysseus, how powerful the gods can be? Could you find anyone more sensible than Ajax? A man with more ability to carry out in every situation the most appropriate action? No one I know. All the same, although he despises me, I pity his misfortune under that yoke of catastrophic madness. It makes me think not just of his fate, but of my own as well. I see that in our lives we are no more than phantoms, insubstantial shadows. 
Well then, now you've seen his arrogance. Make sure you never speak against the gods or give yourself ideas of your own grandeur. If you strength of hand or heaped up riches should outweigh some other man's, a single day pulls down any human scale of fortune or raises it up once more. But the gods love men possess good sense and self-control and despise the ones who are unjust. Athena and Odysseus leave. Enter the chorus, sailors from Salamis and followers of Ajax. Son of Telamon, who holds the throne on wave-washed Salamis beside the sea, I rejoice with you when things go well, but when a blow from Zeus or angry words from slanderous Danaeans are aimed at you, then I hold back in fear and shake with terror like a fluttering eye on a feathered dove. I'm like that now. In the night that's passing, there were noisy rumors thrown against us, against our honor, saying that you went off into that meadow where our horses ranged together with the spoils our spears had captured, prizes which had not yet been allotted, and butchered them with that bright sword of yours. Such slanderous report Odysseus shapes and whispers into every soldier's ear. Many men believe him for he now speaks persuasively about you, and everyone who listens is filled with spite and pleased that you have come to grief, even more than is the man who told them. Throw a spear at some great soul and you will never miss, but if someone said things like that of me, he'd never be believed. Envy creeps up against the man of wealth and power. And yet, without the great, we lesser men are fragile ramparts in our own defense. It's best for small men to ally themselves with greatness and for the powerful to be supported by the lesser men. But teaching foolish people such good sense ahead of time is just not possible. So men like this are now denouncing you. And we do not possess sufficient power to deflect these charges, not without you, not without our king. With you out of their sight, they keep on chattering like flocks of birds. But you unexpectedly appeared, they would be terrified, as if they faced a mighty eagle and soon would cower down and hold their tongues in silence. Was it the god Artemis, bull-tending child of Zeus, who drove you on? Drove you at the common herd? Oh, mighty rumor, mother of my shame. Was it perhaps in retribution for a victory where she received no tribute? Splendid weapons she was cheated of? Or did some hunter kill a stag and set no gifts aside for her? Or... Has Elianios, bronze-plated god of war with reason to complain about an armed alliance, taken his revenge for such an insult by a devious stratagem at night? For with your own mind, oh, son of Telamon, could never go so far along the path to ruin as to attack the flocks. But nothing can prevent a sickness which the gods implant. I pray that Zeus that Phoebus Apollo will stave off this catastrophe, this disastrous rumor of the Argives, if, and if, great kings are slandering you now with stories full of lies. Or is it that man born from the worthless line of Sisyphus? Do not, my lord, take on the grievous weight of a dishonored reputation by remaining here, hiding your presence in this hut besides the sea. Up now, get up from where you sit, Wh wherever you've been settled for so long in your pause from battle. You are fueling a fire of disaster blazing up to heaven. Your enemies' insolence keeps charging on quite fearlessly, whipped up by favoring winds through forest thickets while every soldier wags his tongue and laughs jeers. They bring us grief and reinforce our sorrow. Enter Tecmessa, Ajax's concubine. You men, shipmates of Ajax, 
son of the race of earthborn Erechtheus. All of us who love the distant house of Telamon are in despair. For now our master Ajax, our great and terrifying and forceful king, lies suffering from a tempestuous disease. What heavy grief has come during the night to change the troubles we had yesterday? Daughter of the Phrygian Teleutes, speak to us. Though bold Ajax won you fighting with his spear, he still maintains a strong affection for you. So you may know and offer us an answer. How can I tell a story much too terrifying for words? You will hear of a suffering as harsh as death. Last night, madness seized our glorious Ajax, and now he has been totally disgraced. You can see everything inside his hut, the blood-soaked, butchered victims who were killed as sacrifices by his very hands. The news you tell us of our fiery king we cannot bear, and yet there's no escape. It's what the powerful Danaeans say, what their great storytelling spreads around. Oh, how I fear what's coming next. This man is going to die, and in full public view, with a black sword in those mad hands of his, he massacred the herd and herdsmen too, the ones who ride to guard our animals. Alas, from those fields he came to me right after that, leading his captive beasts. On the floor in there, he slit some of their throats, struck others in the ribs tore them apart. He grabbed two rams, the legs on both were white, cut off the head on one and sliced its tongue right at the tip, then threw the parts away and lashed the other upright on a pillar. He seized a thick strap from the horse's harness and flogged it with a whistling double lash. He was cursing with an awful violence, not human words, ones the gods had taught him. The time has come for us to hide our heads and steal away on foot, or take our seats, each man at his swift oar, and let our ship sail out on her seaworthy way. Those threats our two commanders, sons of Atreus, keep hurling at us are so serious. I am afraid of savage death by stoning, sharing the suffering of the man in there, struck down with him now in the grip of fate, his own inexorable doom. No, no. He is no longer like that. He's grown calm, like a sharp south wind that rushes past without a lightning flash. He's easing off. Now he's sane again, but in new agonies. To look at self-inflicted suffering when no one else played any part in it brings on great anguish. If he's no longer mad, I'm confident that things may be all right. For when disaster has already passed, it doesn't have as much significance. But if you had the choice of causing grief to your own friends while feeling good yourself or grieving too, a suffering man among common sorrow, which would you choose? The double grieving lady is far worse. So, at this moment we, although not sick, are facing disaster. What does that mean? I do not understand what you are saying. That man in there, when he was still so ill, enjoyed himself while savage fantasies held him in their grip. But we were sane. And since he was one of us, we suffered. But now there is pause in his disease. He can recuperate and understand the full extremity of bitter grief. Yet everything for us remains the same. Our anguish is no milder than before. This is surely not a single sorrow, but a double grief. I think that's true. I fear a blow sent from a god has struck him. How else could this take place if his spirit is no more hopeful now than he's been cured than when he was sick? That's how things stand. You must see that. How did this illness start? How did this trouble first swoop down on him? Since we share your pain, tell us what happened. You are all involved in this, and so you'll hear the entire story. At some point in the night, when the evening torches had stopped burning, Ajax took up his two-edged sword, resolved to set off on a senseless expedition. I challenged him and said, what are you doing? Ajax, why are you going out like this? There's been no summons, no messenger, nor any trumpet call. 
all the army is now sleeping. His reply to me was brief, the old refrain. Woman, the finest thing that females do is hold their tongues. So I, taking my cue from that, did not respond. And he charged out alone. I cannot say what went on out there, but he came back and took his chained up prisoners inside, all linked together, bulls and herding dogs and captured sheep. He cut the heads off some. He twisted back the skulls of other beasts and cut their throats or chopped their spines. Others whom he kept tied up, he tortured as if they were human beings, even though it was only beasts he was attacking. At last, he charged out through the doorway and forced out some small words of conversation with a shadow. Sometimes he'd talk about the son of Atreus, at other times about Odysseus, with manic laughter at how by going out, he had avenged all their arrogance in full. After that, he rushed back in the hut again, and there he gradually regained his sense somehow, though not without an effort. Once he saw his room filled up with that deluded slaughter, he struck his head and howled. Then he collapsed, a ruined man among so many ruins, carcasses of slaughtered sheep. He sat there, fists gripping his hair with nails clenched tight. For a long time, he remained quite silent. Then he made some dreadful threats against me if I refused to tell him every detail of what had taken place. He questioned me. What on earth had he become involved with? My friends, I was afraid. So I told him everything that had gone on, all the things I knew were true. He at once began to groan, doleful sounds I'd never heard from him before. He's always claimed that wailing cries like that were only fit for gloomy men and cowards. He used to grieve, but never wail aloud. Just a deep moan like from a lowing bull. But now, overwhelmed by his misfortune, he takes no food, no drink, sprawled in silence where he fell down among dead animals his own sword killed. It seems clear enough he will do something bad. The words he speaks and his laments show that intent somehow. My friends, you should come in and help him if that's possible. That's why I came out here for words from friends can cure a man like him. Tecmessa, daughter of Teleutus, what you've described to us about the man being driven mad with sorrow, that's dreadful. Ay! Alas for me! It looks as if his fit could soon be worse. Did you not hear that loud cry from Ajax? Ay! Alas! I think the man is sick or still suffering the effects of that disease he had before. They're everywhere around him where he sits. My child, my son. How miserable I feel. Eurystice, he's, he's calling you. But why? What does he have in mind? Where are you? I'm overwhelmed. I call on Teucer. Where is Teucer? Will that fighting raid he's on keep going forever with me dying in here? I think the man may have his wits again. Open the door. Perhaps when he sees me, he'll quickly feel a sense of self-respect. There, it's open. Now you can take a look at what he's done and see the state he's in. Ajax is revealed, sitting inside among the dead animals. Ah. <laughs> My cherished sailors, of all my friends, the only one who still observed true loyalty. You see how great a wave has just rolled over me, a crashing surge lashed on by murderous winds. It looks as if what you told us is true. His condition clearly shows his madness. Ah, you race of master mariners who crossed the sea and with your oars sped out across the salty ocean. I see in you and in you alone the one support in my despair. Come help me kill myself. No more of that. Speak words of hope. Don't seek to cure one bad thing with another or make this mad disaster any worse. Do you see how this 
bold and valiant heart, this warrior so fearless in those wars against his enemies has turned his hands, these awesome hands against tame animal. Ah, the mockery. How I have been abused. I beg you, my Lord Ajax, don't say that. Just go away. Why not turn your feet around and wander off somewhere? I... By the gods, concede. Use your common sense. With my bad luck, I let slip from my grasp those criminals deserving punishment. Instead, I went at bulls with twisted horns, fine herds of goats, and made their dark blood flow. Why lament those deeds which have been done and cannot be recalled? Such final acts will never be anything but what they are. Oh, you who keeps prying into everything, you nasty instrument for every crime. Odysseus, the filthy degenerate in all the army, you must be laughing now, taking great delight in this. Divine will determines if each man laughs or cries. But still, I'd like to face him, though I'm injured. Ah! Don't make boasts like that. Do you not see the catastrophe you face? Oh, great Zeus, you ancestral father of my father. If I could die once I'd killed that wheedling scoundrel of mine and those twin reigning kings. When you make that prayer, pray also that I die as well. With you gone, why should I continue living? Oh, darkness, now my daylight. Oh, gloom of Erebus, for me, the brightest light there is. Take me, take me now to live with you. Take me, a man no longer worthy to seek help from families of gods or men, those creatures of a day. For Zeus's daughter, brave Athena, abuses and destroys me. Where can one escape? Where could I go and rest? If my past fame has been cut down along with these dead beasts beside me, then my friends, if I now seek a madman's triumphs, all the army with repeated blows from their own swords will cut me down and slaughter me as well. How hard it is for me to hear this man, this worthy man, say things he'd never say before he had to face such a disaster. Oh, you paths of the resounding sea. You title caves and coastal pastures for a long time now, for far too long you have detained me here in Troy. But that you will no longer do. No, not while I am breathing still. Let men of sense be sure of that. <laughs> oh, you streams of the Scamander, my neighbor, so friendly to the Argives, you no longer will be seeing Ajax, a man who's equal as warrior, and I can make this boast. Troy never saw arriving here from Greece. But now I lie among this heap, dishonored. I don't have the strength to stop your words or to let you go on saying such things. You've fallen into such calamity. Alas, who would ever think my name would suit my troubles so poetically? For I could well cry out two or three times, alas, for Ajax! That shows the magnitude of the disaster I am going through. I am the man whose father's excellence won supreme respect from all the army. He took the fairest prize and carried home every glory from the land of Ida. I am his son who journeyed after him to this same land of Troy. I am just as strong with the work of my own hands. I have attained achievements just as great, but as you see, these Argive insults have quite ruined me. And yet I think I can affirm this much. Had Achilles lived and been about to judge the man who should receive his weapons, the prize for being the finest man in war, no soldier would have put his hand on them before I did. But now the sons of Atreus have dealt them to a fellow whose spirit will stoop to anything and pushed aside all those triumphant victories of Ajax. If with my distorted mind and eyes I'd not abandoned what I'd planned to do, they would not have had what's mine by right to put the vote against another man. But then that goddess with the glaring eyes, impeccable Athena, Zeus's daughter, overthrew me at the very instant I was steadying my hand against them. She hurled in me a frenzied sickness, so blood from grazing beasts would stain my hands, and those men now can laugh at their escape, something I did not want. But when a god commits an injury, 
the unworthy man escaped someone more powerful. And now what do I do when I am obviously hated by the gods, when the Greek army despises me and everyone in Troy and on the plain holds me an enemy? Should I give up my station in the fleet, leaving the sons of Atreus alone and sail home across the Aegean Sea? How could I face my father, Telamon, when I arrive back there? How could he bear to see me showing up with nothing without the prize for highest excellence, which with he won his own great crown of fame? That is not a thing I could endure to do. <laughs> well then, should I charge out there on my own against the Trojan Wall, alone attack, fight single combats, do something valiant and then at last be killed? But that would please the sons of Atreus. It must not happen. I must seek out some act which will reveal to my old father how, at least by nature, his own son has not become a coward. It is dishonorable for any man to crave a lengthy life once he discovers the troubles he is in will never change. What joy is there for him when every day just follows on another, pulling him away or pushing him toward death? I would not pay for any sort of mortal man who's warmed by futile hopes. A man of noble birth lives on with honor or he dies in glory. Now you've heard everything I have to say. No one will ever claim that you, Ajax, have said a word that's illegitimate, for what you say is born in your own heart. But you should stop. Get rid of thoughts like these. Let friends overrule what you are suggesting. Oh, my lord Ajax. For human beings, the worst of evils is what they endure. When they're compelled to, consider me. I was the daughter of a freeborn father, a wealthy man. If anyone in Phrygia could be accounted rich, now I'm a slave, a circumstance the gods somehow made happen. Yes, the gods and especially your strong limbs. And thus, since I have come into your bed, I want the best for you. So I beg you, by Zeus who guards our home, by that bed where you have sex with me, do not leave me to the savage insults of your enemies. Do not abandon me to some strange hand. For if you die and leave me all alone, that day you may be sure the Argive men will take me by force, as well as your own son. Then both of us will lead the lives of slaves. One of our lords will speak these biting words, shooting insults at me. Look here, at this, a bedmate of Ajax, the strongest man in all of our army. What menial chore she does. How she's changed from such an enviable state. Men will talk that way. And then my fate will wear me down. Such shameful words will stain you and your family. Respect your father, whom you will leave a miserable old man. Respect your mother too who shares his years. She keeps begging the gods that you still live, that you'll return back home. And my Lord, have pity for your son. For if you die, consider how, whenever the day comes, both he and I will face desolation. He will lack the nurturing a young lad needs if you leave and he becomes an orphan in the care of people who are no friends or from his family. And I have nothing I can look to except you. It was you who killed my homeland for me with your spear. My mother and father were destroyed by a different fate, which led them down to make their home in Hades after death. What country could I have except with you? What wealth, my safety, all security that rests with you. So remember me as well. A genuine man should cherish memory. If he get pleasure still from anything, kindness always engenders gratitude. A man who gives up his good memories will no longer be a noble, worthy man. Ajax, I wish that pity touched your heart as it does mine. Then you'd approve her words. So far as I'm concerned, she'll win approval only if she keeps on being obedient and carries out my orders properly. Yes, beloved Ajax, I will obey in everything. Then bring me my son so I may see him. I sent him away, out of my care, 
I was so terrified. Afraid because I was in trouble. What do you mean? Yes, that's it. I feared that the unlucky, unlucky boy might bother you and then somehow get killed. <laughs> yes, such a thing the God who watches me would think fitting. At least I took suitable precaution to stop that from happening. I approve of that. The steps you took were quite correct. And so, as things are now, how can I best serve you? Let me talk to him. See him face to face. Yes. He's close by, with servants watching him. Why then this delay? Why is he not here? My son, your father is calling you. Whichever of your servants has his hand, bring the boy out here. Is he coming? The one you called, or did he not hear? The servant's on his way. He's bringing Eurysthes with him. Enter the servant, you're meeting Eurysthes. Lift him up. Hand the boy to me up here. He'll have no fear of fresh spilt blood. No, not if he's a true bred son of mine who shares his father's nature. It is time he was broken into that harsh code his father follows and his nature shaped to something like my own. Oh, my boy. May you have better fortunes than your father, although remain like him in other ways, for then you'll never be dishonored. Now I envy you, and with good reason, for you have no idea of any troubles. The sweetest life comes when one senses nothing. To lack all feeling is a painless evil until you learn what joy and sorrow mean. Once you reach that stage, you must reveal the kind of man you are, your ancestry, to those who were your father's enemies. Meanwhile, you should feed on gentle breezes, fostering your young life so as to bring your mother joy. I know that Noah Kean will go at you with insults and contempts even when I'm gone, for I am leaving Teucer here with you as guardian of your gates. He will not falter in his care for you, although he is now busy far away chasing his enemies. But my warriors, my people of the sea, I charge you now with the same joyful duty I give to you, sir. Report to him what I have ordered here. He is to take this boy back to my home, show him to Telamon and Arabia, my mother, so he may always comfort them in their old age until the time they reach the yawning caverns of the gods below. And none of those who judge our competitions, nor the man who ruined me, will offer my weapon as a prize for the Achaeans. No, my son, for my sake, you will have to take that broad shield from which you get your name. Hold it up high. Shift it by its well-stitched grip, my impenetrable seven-layered shield. My other weapons, you will vary with me. Come, take boy and quickly close the hut. And don't keep on wailing here in front how these women really love their wailing. Quick now, close up the hut. A skillful healer does not howl incantation when a wound is crying for the knife. When I hear that you're in such a rush, I get afraid. The sharp end on your tongue brings me no joy. Oh, my lord Ajax, what are you going to do? Don't keep on asking me. No more questions. The best thing now is self-restraint. But I'm desperate. By the gods, by your own son, I beg you, do not become a man who now betrays us. You pester me too much. Do you not see that I no longer owe my gods my service? You must not utter such impurities. Speak to those who listen. Will you not hear me? You have already chattered far too much. Yes, my lord, because I'm so afraid. Shut the doors, do it now. By all gods, relent. It looks as though you're thinking like a fool if, at this late date, you still believe that what you teach will shape my character. The servants close the main door of the hut, leaving Ajax inside. Tecmessa, Eurysthes, and the servants go into the hut through the side door from which Eurysthes emerged earlier. Oh, splendid Solomus, you, I know, lie in the sea whose waves beat on your happy shores a famous place among all men forever. I have been held back a long time here in misery. For countless months still cramped and camped out in the fields of Ida, consumed by time and my anxiety, expecting to complete my journey to implacably destructive Hades. And now my troubles multiply, a situation hard to remedy, for I must wrestle now with Ajax, 
share my life with that insanity sent from the gods. Alas for me. Once, long ago, you sent him out, filled with the frenzied power of war, but now his spirit feeds in isolation, and his friends acquire from him a heavy sorrow. His earlier deeds, those acts of highest excellence, have fallen, fallen where he has no friends, among the wretched, hostile sons of Atreus. Years have changed his mother's hair to white and given her old age for company. So when she learns of his disease, that maddening infection of his mind, she'll start to moan aloud in grief. She will not chant out melodies sung by plaintive nightingales, no. In her mood of desolation, the sharp-toned music of her pain will scream abroad her anguish. Her beating hands will thud down on her breast and she'll keep tearing out her old gray hair. A man brain sick with mad delusions is better concealed in Hades. A man who by his ancestry is ranked the best of the Achaeans who have endured so much. But now, no longer following his inbred character. He wanders far beyond himself. Oh, you unhappy father Telamon, you have yet to hear the heavy curse laid upon your son. A curse which up to now has never played a part in any life nurtured by the sons of Aeacus. Enter Ajax through the main doors of the hut with a sword. Tecmessa enters after him. The long succession of the countless years reveals what's hidden, then hides it once again, and there is nothing we should not anticipate. The solemn oath and the most stubborn heart are overcome. In this way, even I, who used to be so marvelously strong, like tempered iron, felt my sharp edge dissolve at what this woman said. I now feel pity, leaving her a widow and my son an orphan among my enemies. And so I'll go to the bathing waters by the seashore and wash off my defilement. I will deflect the weighty anger of the goddess there. When I leave, I'll find some isolated place and then enter my sword. Of all my weapons, the one I most despise. I'll dig the earth where no one else will see. Then let night and Hades keep it there below the ground. For ever since I've held it in my grip, this gift from Hector, my greatest enemy, I've won no prizes from the Argives. <laughs> that old human saying is true. Gifts men get from enemies, they are no gifts at all and bring them no advantages. And so from this day forward, I shall understand how to revere the gods and I will learn how to respect the sons of Atreus. They are our, our rulers, so we must obey. Why not? Things of the greatest power and awe give way to privileged authorities. Snow-footed winter yields to fruitful summer and night's dark valet withdraws the moment day with her white-footed horses fires up the sky. The blasts of fearful winds at last bring rest which calms the groaning seas. All powerful sleep lets go the one he holds tied up in chains. His grasp does not go on forever. As for us, how can we mortals not learn self-control? I, at least, am only now discovering that we should hate our enemies as much as suits a man who will become a friend. And when I help a friend, then I will give only what is due a man who will not remain a friend forever. For common mortals see that the shelter comradeship affords is treacherous. Thus, my situation will turn out for the best. And so woman, go inside now. Keep praying to the gods, my heart's desires will reach fulfillment and be carried out to their conclusion. Tecmessa returns into the hut through the side door. Ajax turns to address the chorus. My comrade, you too honor this request. Tell Teucer when he comes to care for me and also to protect your interests. I am now going where I have to go. As for you, carry out what I have said. And very soon, perhaps, you will find out that, though I am suffering now, I am at peace. Ajax leaves, heading for the seashore. 
I feel a sudden thrill of passionate delight, which makes me soar aloft in happiness and, and cry with joy to Pan. Oh, Pan, Pan, appear to us, sea rover, come down from your stony ridge on snow beat Mount Zelini. Dancing master of the gods, come, oh, king. Begin your self-taught dancing sips from Mesia to Kenosis, for what I want now is to dance. And may Apollo, Lord of Thelios, raise across the Icarian Sea and manifest himself to me. Show his benevolence in everything. From our eyes, Ares has removed those terrifying agonies. But joy, oh, joy. For now, oh Zeus, now, the dazzling light of brighter days can come to our swift ships with speed across the seas, for Ajax is free. <laughs> He's free of pain once more and, in a transformed state of mind, has carried out appropriate sacrifice to all the gods in full, showing them due reverence and strictly following our most important laws. The power of time extinguishes all things. So I can't say that anything lies beyond all expectation, since in contrast to what we're waiting for, now Ajax's mind has changed again. Away from actions done in anger and his great fight with Atreus's sons. Enter the messenger. Friends, the first thing I've come to report is this. Teucer has just come from the Mesian Heights. He's now in the middle of our line of ships in the general's camp. All the Argives are shouting insults at him all at once. They saw him coming and as he approached, surrounded him, hurling accusation from all directions. Everyone joined in, calling him the brother of that maniac who had conspired against the army and saying he could not escape his death. Their stones would cut, them down, cut him down completely. Things reached the point where, the, where men had pulled their swords out of their scabbards and held them fully drawn. Then as the fight was getting out of hand, some elders intervened. Their words stopped it. But where can I find Ajax to tell him this? I must provide our king a full report. He's not inside. He has just gone away with new intentions yoked to his changed mood. Oh no, no, then the man who sent me here did so too late or I have been too slow. What's so urgent? What's been overlooked? Teucer said that Ajax had to stay inside and not leave his hut until he gets here. Well, as I told you, Ajax has gone off. He intends to follow now what's best for him, to cleanse away his anger at the gods. Your words reveal your complete foolishness if what Calchas prophecies has any merit. What do you mean? What information do you have about what's happening here? Well, I was there, so I know this much. I witnessed it. Calchas left the leaders sitting in their royal council circle, moving off from the sons of Atreus. In a friendly gesture, he placed his right hand in Teucer's palm. Then he spoke to him, giving him strict orders to use every means to keep Ajax in his hut while the stay lasts and to pre prevent him moving anywhere if he ever wished to see him still alive for Divine Athena's rage would whip Ajax only for that day. That's what Calchas said. And the prophet added, those living things which become too large and thus unwieldy fall into harsh disasters from the gods. The sort of man who born from human stock forgets and thinks beyond his mortal state. Take Ajax. As soon as he set out from home, he revealed his folly. Though his father had passed on good advice. For Telamon commanded him, my son, with that spear of yours, you must seek victory, but always fight with some god at your side. But then Ajax, in a lofty boast, thoughtlessly replied, Father, with God's help, even a worthless man can be victorious, but I believe I'll win glory on my own without them. Such was his arrogance. Another time with divine Athena, as she was rousing him and telling him to turn his deadly hands against the enemy, he answered her with a fearful and sacrilegious speech. Lady, stand there with the other Argives. The fight will never break the line through Ajax. It was with words like these that he provoked the unremitting anger of the goddess, because he does not think as humans should. 
but if he remi- remains alive all day today, with God's help, we might be his saviors. That's what Calca said. From where he sat, Chaucer sent me off at once with orders which you were meant to follow. If we fail, Ajax is done for. That is, if Calchas has any skill in prophecy. Tecmessa! Unfortunate lady born for sorrow, come out and see this man. Hear his news. The razor slicing closer. I feel its pain. Enter Tecmessa through the side door of the hut. Why are you making me come out once more and leave the chair where I was getting some relief from these unending troubles? Listen to this man. He's come with news about what's happening with Ajax, and it's disturbing. Oh no. You there. Tell me what you have to say. Does this mean we're finished? I have no idea how things stand with you. As for Ajax, if he is not inside, then I have lost hope. He's gone away. So I'm in agony about just what you mean. Tucer gave me orders that you keep Ajax safely in his hut and do not let him leave all by himself. But where is Tucer? Why did he say that? He has only just returned. He suspects if Ajax goes somewhere, he'll be destroyed. That's horrible. What man told him this? Hester's son, the prophet, whose words proclaimed this very day would bring life or death for Ajax. Oh, my friends, protect me from this destiny. Some of you, get to Sir here more quickly, while others go off to the western cove and to the east as well to investigate. Find out where Ajax went when he set off on that ill-fated path. For now, I know I have, in fact, been totally deceived, and Ajax has finally cast away all that affection he once had for me. Alas, my son, what am I going to do? I can't stay idle. So I'll go out there, as far as I have the strength to go. Let's leave, and hurry. This is no time to sit around if we want to save a man who's eager for destruction. I am prepared to help, not just with words, as I will demonstrate. If we move fast, we can do this quickly. They all exit in various directions, leaving the stage empty. The scene now changes to a deserted part of the seashore. Ajax enters, carrying his sword, which he sets upright in the sand, with the blade sticking upward. The sacrificial killer is in its place, so it will now cut most effectively. If a man had time, he might reflect on this. It is a gift from Hector, a warrior who was a friend most hateful to me, the one I looked on as my greatest foe. Then this sword is set firmly in Trojan soil, land of my enemy, freshly wedded on the iron-eating, sharpening stone. And I have fixed it in the ground with care so it will kill me quickly and be kind. Thus we are well prepared. So, O Zeus, in this situation, be the first to help as is appropriate. I'm not asking you to give me a grand prize, but for my sake, send a messenger to carry this bad news to Chaucer, so he may be the first to raise me once I've fallen on the sword and covered it with fresh spilt blood. Don't let the first to spot me be some enemy who will throw me out, exposed as carrion food for dogs and birds. I appeal to you, O Zeus, grant me this much. I also call on Hermes, guide to the world below, to let me sleep without convulsions, when by one quick leap I break my bones apart on this sharp blade. And I summon those immortal maidens to my aid, those who always see all things of human suffering, the dread, far-striding furies, to witness how, in my wretchedness, the sons of Atreus brought on my destruction. May they seize on them and destroy them too, with deaths as vile as their disgusting selves. Just as they see me killed by my own hand, so let them perish, killed by their own kindred, the children they love most. Come, you furies, you swift punishers, devour the army, all of them, sparing no one. And you, Helios, whose chariot wheels that climb that steep path to heaven, when you look down over my father's land, pull back those reins of yours which flash with gold, then tell the story of my miseries, my destiny, to my old father and to the unhappy one who nursed me. That poor lady, 
when she hears this news, will, I think, sing out a huge lamenting dirge throughout the city. But for me to weep is useless. It's time to start the final act. Oh, death, death, come now and watch in person. Yet I'll be seeing you on the other side and there we can converse. And so to you, the radiant light of this bright shining day, I'll make my final call into the sun. We'll never see that chariot anymore. Oh light, oh sacred land of Salamis, my home, my father's sturdy hearth and glorious Athens, whose race was bred related to my own. And you rivers, you streams, you plains of Troy, I call on you. Farewell, you who have nurtured me. To you, Ajax now speaks his final words. The rest I'll say to those below in Hades. Ajax falls on his sword. Enter the chorus in two separate groups from two different directions. Each has a separate leader. They do not see Ajax's body until Tecmessa finds it. We work and work, and that brings on more work. Where have I not walked? Where? No place where I have searched has revealed to me where Ajax is. What's that? Listen, I heard a noise. It's us, the crew that shares the ships with you. What can you report? We searched everywhere on the west side of the ships. Did you come up with anything? Just lots of work. There's nothing there to see. Well, we haven't seen him either, not on the path facing the rising sun. Who then can lead me on? What toiling sons of the sea sleepless in their shacks? What nymph on high Olympus or from the streams that flow into the Bosphorus could say if she has seen somewhere fierce-hearted Ajax wandering around? It is not fair that after such a long search and so much effort, I can't find the proper path to him. I cannot see where that elusive man may be. Enter Tecmessa behind the chorus. As she moves on, she stumbles across the corpse of Ajax. Uh, who cried out? It sounded close from that group of trees. Oh, how horrible. I see her. The unfortunate young bride, Tecmessa, a prize won with his spear. She's lying there prostrate with grief in pain. I'm lost, de destroyed. My life is over. Oh, my friends. What's happened? It's our Ajax. He's lying here. He's just been murdered. His body's wrapped around his own, a buried sword. Oh no! Our dreams of getting home are gone. Alas, my king, you have destroyed me too, the one who sailed across the seas with you. You poor, unhappy man, heartsick lady. With Ajax dead like this, we have good cause to wail out our grief. Who did this? With whose help could ill-fitted Ajax have gone through with this? He did it by himself. That's clear. The sword is fixed upright in the ground, indicates he fell down on top of it. Alas, for my own foolishness. You bled to death alone, with no friends there to keep an eye on you. I was so stupid so blind to everything. I took no care. And now, now where does stubborn Ajax lie? A man whose very name suggests misfortune. He is not a spectacle to gaze upon. With this cloak, I will cover him completely. Tuck it all around him. For nobody, at least no one who was a friend of his, could bear to see him as he spurts blood up his nostrils and from the dark red wound, his self-inflicted slaughter. Alas, what shall I do? What friend of yours will lift you up for burial? Where's Teucer? How I wish that he would come right now when we need him. 
if he ever comes to care for the body of his brother. Oh, ill-fated Ajax. How could a man like you end up like this? Even your enemies must find you worthy of a funeral song. Oh, you unhappy man. How you were doomed. With that unbending heart of yours fated to live out an evil destiny of endless suffering. I know you groaned such hostile words against the sons of Atreus all night long and into the morning light. That fatal passion of a stubborn heart. It's obvious that when those weapons were made the prizes in the competition for the finest of our battle warriors, that was a potent source of trouble. Alas. Alas for me. Your heart, I know, is truly filled with grief. Such agony for me. It's no surprise to me, my lady, that you wail and wail again, for you've just lost a man you loved so much. You only guess how it must feel. But I experience it. And to the limit. That's true enough. Alas, my son. What kind of slavery will yoke us now as we move on from here? What sort of taskmasters stand over us? Ah, now you've given voice to your concerns about unspeakable actions by those men, the two unfeeling sons of Atreus, in this our present grief. May God restrain them. <laughs> but these events would not have taken place without God's consent. Yes. They have set a burden too heavy for us to bear. It's Athena, Zeus's savage daughter. What miseries that goddess has produced. And for Odysseus's sake. I'm sure that man who has endured so much in his black heart exults and laughs with lofty arrogance in these insane disasters. Such mockery, such a disgrace. And when they hear of this, those two royal sons of Atreus will join his mer in his merriment. Then let them laugh. Let them get their joy from this man's agony. Although they did not sense their need of him while he was living, perhaps they'll mourn his death when they need him in war. Men with brutal minds have no idea what fine things they possess until they throw them out. Ajax's death to me so bitter and them so sweet, at least has brought him joy, for he has got what he desired, the death he yearned for. So why should these men make fun of him? His death is the gods' concern, not theirs. No. So let Odysseus vaunt his empty jests. For them, Ajax is dead. For me, he's gone, abandoning me to grief and mourning. No, no, no. Be quiet. I think I hear Teucer's voice. His shout sends out a tone which penetrates the heart of this disaster. Enter Teucer, moving up to Ajax's body. Oh, dearest Ajax, my bright source of joy, my brother, what's happened to you? Is the rumor true? He's dead, Teucer. That's the truth. Alas. Then I bear a heavy destiny. Given how things stand, this is too sad. You have good cause to grieve. This act of his, so rash and passionate. Yes, too, sir, passion in excess. This is disastrous. What about his son? Where on Trojan soil can I find him? He's in the hut, all by himself. You bring him here as soon as possible, in case he gets snatched by an enemy the way a hunter grabs a lion cub and leaves its mother childless. Go quickly. We need your help, for it's a fact all men love to laugh in triumph above the dead when they're stretched out before them. Exit, Tecmessa. To sir, when Ajax was alive, he said that you should look after his son as you're now doing. Oh, this is surely the most painful sight of anything my eyes have ever seen. And of all the roads I've traveled, the worst, the one most deeply painful to my heart is that pathway I've just walked along. 
while trying to track you down, dearest Ajax, once I'd learned your fate. There was some gossip, some tale to do with you. It spread quickly, as if sent by a god to all the Argives. It said that you had wandered off and died. I heard the details far away from here, and there I groaned with sorrow. Now I'm here, I see it for myself. It breaks my heart. It's dreadful. Come, take off this covering so I get a full view of this horror. Pendants remove the cloak covering Ajax's body. Oh, that face. It's so painful to see now, so full of bitter daring. How many sorrows you have sown for me by this destruction. Where can I go? What sort of people will take me in when I was no use to you in times of trouble? No doubt Telamon, who fathered you and me, will welcome me, perhaps with smiles and words of kindness when I reach home without you. Of course he will, for he's the kind of man who never smiles, not cheerfully, not even when things go well. A man like that, what will he not say? What sort of insults will he not hurl at me? A bastard spawned by some battle prize of his, who, because of his unmanly cowardice, betrayed you, dearest Ajax, or by treachery tried to seize your power and your home once you were dead. That's what Telamon will say. He's a bad-tempered man, and his old age has made him harsh. His anger likes to argue over nothing. He'll end up banishing me, throw me from the land. What he'll say of me will make me seem a slave instead of free. That's what will happen if I go back home. Here in Troy, I have many enemies and few ways of getting help. All this happened to me because you've been killed. It's a disaster. What am I to do? How do I raise you up, you sad corpse from the sharp bite of this glittering sword, your murderer on which you breathed your last? You've come to sense how, in good time, Hector, though dead, was going to slaughter you. Look here, by the gods. See the fate of these two men. First, Hector was lashed tight to that chariot rail with the very belt Ajax had given him, and underwent continual mutilation until he gasped his life away. Then Ajax took Hector's gift in hand and used it to kill himself in that death-dealing fall. Surely a vengeful fury forged this blade, and that harsh craftsman Hades made that belt? For my part, I would assert that gods have plotted these events. They always do in everything that mortal men go through. If someone finds this view objectionable, let him love his own beliefs, as I do mine. Don't stay too long. You need to think how we can bury Ajax, and what to say. It's urgent. For someone's coming here, a man who is our enemy. It could be he who comes to mock at our misfortunes, a man who thrives on harm. Who is it, the man you see? What member of the army? It's Menelaus, the one for whom we launched this expedition. I see him. He's not hard to recognize when he's so close. Enter Menelaus with a small escort of soldiers. You there, I order you not to take up that corpse for burial. Leave it where it is. Why waste your words with such an order? I think it's fitting, as does the commander of our army. Then would it bother you to tell me why you issue this command? The reason's this. We hoped that we were leading Ajax here away from home so he'd be our ally, someone friendly to the Argives. But instead, when we saw him more closely, we found out he was more hostile than the Phrygians. He planned to destroy our entire army and set off at night to take us with his spear. If some god had not frustrated his attempt, we would have met the same fate he did. We'd be dead and lying there struck down by shameful fate and he'd be still alive. But now it's clear, a god changed these events and so the violence in his heart fell elsewhere on sheep and cattle. And that's the reason there's no one powerful enough right now to take his corpse and set it in a grave. Instead, it will be tossed away somewhere on the yellow sand, food for shorebirds. Remember that. Curb the anger in your heart. If we cannot control him when he lived, at least he will obey us now that he's dead. Even if you don't agree, our forceful hands will take charge of him. When he was alive, Ajax never listened to a word I said, 
And it's a fact that when a common man thinks it's appropriate to disobey those in command, he truly demonstrates his worthless character. Within the city, the laws could never foster benefits if there was no established place for fear. Nor can one lead the troops with a wise restraint where there is neither fear or reverence to act in their defense. So any man, no matter how powerful his body grows, must, must realize he'll fall even when the harm to him seems trivial. A man who has in him a sense of fear and shame is quite secure, you can be sure of that. But where there's room for hostile arrogance and men do what they want, consider how a state like that, though it has raced ahead with favoring winds, will in the course of time sink in the ocean depths eventually. And so for me, let fear be set in place where it's appropriate. Let's not believe we can just do whatever we desire and not pay the painful consequence. These matters fluctuate. Ajax was once a man of fiery insolence, but now it's time for me to manifest my power. And thus I warn you not to bury him. If you do, you just might fall yourself into your grave. Menelaus, after setting out such well thought precepts, do not become too arrogant yourself in dealing with the dead. Fellow soldiers, never again will I be much surprised if someone born a nobody goes wrong, since those apparently of noble birth can make so many errors when they speak. Come, tell me once more from the beginning, do you really think it was you personally who led Ajax here in Argive ally? Did he not sail to Troy all on his own under his own command? In what respect are you this man's superior? On what ground do you have any right to rule those men whom he led here from home? You came to Troy as king of Sparta. You do not govern us. Under no circumstance did some right to rule or give him orders lie within your power, just as he possessed no right to order you. You sailed here a subordinate to others, not as commander of the entire force who could at any time tell Ajax what to do. Go. Be king of those you rule by right. Use those proud words of yours to punish them. But I will set this body in a grave, as justice says I should, even though you or any other general forbids it. I am not afraid of your pronouncements. Ajax did not join the expedition because that woman was a wife of yours, as did those toiling Spartan drudges. No, but because he'd sworn an oath to do it. You were no part of it. He never valued men worth nothing. And so when you return, come back here and bring more heralds with you, as well as the commander. Your vain chat is not something that really bothers me, not while you stay the kind of man you are. When things go badly, I don't like to hear a tone like that, even when it's justified harsh language stings. This mere archer seems to entertain some big ideas. Indeed I do. My skill is not something to underrate. My, my. If only you possessed a shield, how grand your boasts would be. Even with no shield, I'd get the better of you fully armed. That tongue of yours, how it likes to feed the savage spirit inside. When a man is right, he's entitled to make impressive claims. Do you mean to tell me it is just for someone to be treated generously when he's killed me? Killed you? Your words sound odd if, after being killed, you are now alive. Some god saved me. As far as Ajax knows, I'm dead and gone. Since the gods rescued you, you should not now dishonor them. You mean I could be violating sacred laws? Yes, if you personally intervened to prevent the burial of the dead. That's not so with a personal enemy. To bury him would not be right. What's that? Did Ajax ever march ahead in battle as your enemy? He hated me and I hated him. But you knew that. Yes, he did. Because you were found out. You tampered with the vote which robbed him. The judges beat him in that competition, not me. With your deceitful secrecy, you can conceal so many crimes. Words like that could well prove painful to a man I know. Well, I don't think they will bring more pain than we'll inflict. Once and for all then, I tell you this. That man will not be buried. Then hear my answer. Ajax's corpse will have a burial. 
I have already seen a man with a bold tongue urging sailors on to launch a voyage during winter storms. But you could hear no sound from him at all once the storm got nasty. He hid himself under a cloak and then let the sailors step on him at will. You're just like him. You and your braggart mouth. A mighty squall, even from a tiny cloud in no time, will snuff out your constant shouting. And I have seen a man stuffed with stupidity, whose pride delighted in his neighbor's grief. Then someone like me, with my temperament, faced up to him and said something like this. Hey, you there, don't harm the dead. If you do, you can be sure you'll find yourself in trouble. So he warned the paltry fellow face to face. I see him now, and it appears to me he is none other than yourself. I trust I haven't talked too much in riddles. I'm leaving. It would be a great disgrace if men found out I've started arguing when I could use my power. Be off with you. It would be a great disgrace to me to listen to such silly chattering from some fool. Menelaus and his escort leave the way they came. We are going to see a major altercation from this argument. As quickly as you can to, sir, you should make a hollow grave for Ajax, where he'll rest in a dark tomb, and people for all time will keep him in their memory. Enter Tecmessa and Eurythophes. Ah, just in time. His woman and his son have now arrived to perform a funeral for this sad corpse. Come, lad, move over here. Stand there by him. Set your hand in supplication on him, on your father from whom you were born. Kneel down in prayer. Hold firmly in your hand locks of hair from me, from her, from you, the three of us. These give the suppliant strength. If any member of the army tries to remo remove you from this corpse by force, then may that wicked man become an exile, tossed out from his own land in misery, and remain unburied, his roots severed from his whole race, just as I cut this hair. Take this, my boy, and guard it, and don't let any man push you away. Stay kneeling here and hang on tight. You sailors over there, don't stand around the place like women. Your men, stand on guard here and protect him till I get back once I've set up the grave. I don't care who has forbidden it. Exit Tuther. When will our last year here arrive? When will the number of those wandering years come to an end? And my interminable fate to go on carrying this toiling spear across the wide expanse of Troy. A sorrow and a shame for Greeks. How I wish that man had been swept off high into the great sky or into Hades, the home that all men share. Before he'd introduced the Greeks to that war mood, which sucks up everyone, those weapons of the gods of war, which every man detests. Oh, those toils, which just produce more toil. That man has wiped out our humanity. He gave me as my portion no delight in garlands or full cups of wine. No sweet tunes from flutes around me. That ill-fated wretch, or in the night the joys of sleep. <laughs> and as for love, alas, he has denied me love. I lie here forgotten my hair always drenched from thickly falling dew. <laughs> yes, my memories from a desolate Troy. Bold Ajax used to be my rampart once, my constant wall against night fears and flying weapons aimed at me, but, he has now become a sacrifice to some malevolent deity. What pleasure then, what joy now lies in store for me? Oh, oh I wish I were back there. 
where the wooded wave-washed headland juts out our guard against the open sea. Below the high flat rock of Sunami. And we could then greet sacred Athens. Enter Teuther in a hurry. I've just seen Commander Agamemnon. He's coming here and quickly, so I ran back. He's clearly going to give his blundering mouth some exercise. Enter Agamemnon with an armed escort. You there. I've been told you've dared to mouth foul threats against us with impunity. I'm talking about you, the son of a mere slave, a battle trophy. If some well-bred lady were your mother, no doubt your boasts would soar high in the sky and you would strut around on tiptoe. You are a nobody. And here you act the champion for this non-entity. In all seriousness, you made the claim we voyaged here with no authority as commanders of the troops or of the fleet to give orders to Achaeans or to you since Ajax sailed under his own command. Is it not shameful that I have to hear such monstrous insults from the mouths of slaves? This man you shout about with so much pride, what sort of man was he? Where did he go or stand and fight where I was not there too? Do the Achaeans have no man but him? It seems it was a painful thing we did when we announced to all Achaeans that competition for Achilles' weapons. If in every quarter we appear corrupt thanks to Teucer, and if you people here never will be satisfied, not even after you have been put down and yield to what most of the judges thought was fair. Instead, you will no doubt keep hurling at us these constant jibes or from your station in the rear treacherously lash out at us. In places where such conditions hold, you'll never find a settled order based on rule of law. Not if we discard the men who justly win and put in front the ones who lag behind. No, we must prevent such tendencies. It's not the big broad shouldered warriors who make the most reliable allies. It's men who think they win out every time. One guides a broad backed ox straight down the path with only a small whip. And I can see you'll soon receive some of that medicine unless you get yourself some common sense. That man is no longer living. By this time he has become a shade and here you are, rashly insulting us, letting your mouth run on and on. You should control yourself. Do you not realize who you are by birth? Why not let another man step forward, someone freeborn to state your case to us instead of you? For when you're speaking, I'm not prepared to listen anymore. To me, your barbarian way of speaking is quite impossible to understand. I wish you two were sensible enough to show some self-restraint, but nothing I say would be more useful to the both of you. Well now, how quickly among mortal men grateful thoughts about the dead are gone and turn into betrayal. This man here can't even manage a few words, Ajax, to celebrate your memory. And yet you often risked your life protecting him, hefting that spear of yours in battle. But now, as you can see, all those great deeds are dead and gone, all thrown aside. Teucer turns to address Agamemnon. And you. You talk a lot of utter foolishness. Have you no longer any memory of the time when you were all bunched up inside the rampart, almost done for in that spear fight? Then Ajax showed up, all on his own, and kept protecting you, with flames already blazing on your ships, spreading across the decks right at the stern, and Hector leaping high across the ditch, heading for our fleet. Who held him back? Was Ajax not the one who managed that? The men you claim never went to any place where you did not go to? Do you concede his actions then, as far as you're concerned, set a high standard? And then another time, when he faced up to Hector by himself in single combat. No one ordered him. He was picked out by lot, and his marker, the one he threw in among the others, was not designed to help him not get picked. It was no lump of moistened clay, no but a light one, which would be the first out of the crested helmet. Yes, Ajax was the one who did these things, and I, the slave, whose mother was a foreigner, was there beside him. 
You miserable man, where are your eyes when you go on like this? Do you not realize your father's father, ancient Pelops, was a barbarian who came from Phrygia? And Atreus, the man who spawned you, wasn't he the one who prepared that sacrilegious dinner and served up his own brother's children as a meal for him to eat? And then as for yourself, the mother who bore you came from Crete, and her own father caught her having sex, screwing some stranger. He abandoned her to be killed in silence by a bunch of fish. That's the kind of man you are. How can you insult a man like me about my origins? I am a son of Telamon, who won my mother as his consort, his own prize for being the army's finest warrior. She was of royal blood, Laomedon's daughter, the most desirable of all the battle spoils. Alcmene's son gave her to Telamon. Since I am nobly born and my parents are both noble too, how could I disgrace my own flesh and blood? Ajax is lying here, overcome by all his troubles, and you, aren't you shamed to say you'll toss him out without a burial? Well, think of this. If you just throw him out, along with him, you'll be casting off three more as well. It's a finer thing for men to see me die while laboring hard on his behalf than fighting for your woman, or should I say your brother's wife. Given what I've said, don't think about my safety. Look to your own. For if you make things difficult for me, you're going to wish you had been more afraid and not so bold when you confronted me. And here Odysseus alone. Lord Odysseus, you've come just in time if you are here to calm things down and not make them worse. My friends, what's going on? From a long way off, I heard the sons of Atreus shouting out over this brave man's body. Lord Odysseus, we have had to listen for far too long to the most shameful language from this man. Is that not reason enough? Well, let's see. I could forgive a man who had been listening to someone else who was abusing him and then who joined in a war of insults. I did insult him because his actions were a direct affront to me. What did he do to injure you? He says he will not let this corpse remain without a burial. He'll set it in a grave no matter what I do. Well, may someone who's a friend of yours speak his mind and still remain a colleague the way he was before? You should speak out. I would scarcely be thinking properly if I said no. Among the Argives, I consider you my greatest friend. Then listen. In deference to the gods, don't be so unyielding you throw Ajax out without a burial. You should not let that spirit of violence at any time seize control of you, not to the extent that you then trample justice underfoot. This man became my greatest enemy in all our army on that very day I beat him for the armor of Achilles. But for all the man's hostility to me, I would not disgrace him, nor would I deny that in my view, he was the finest warrior among the Argive men who came to Troy after Achilles. So if you dishonor him, you would be unjust. It would not harm him, but you'd be contravening all those laws the gods established. When a good man dies, it is not right to harm him even though he may be someone you hate. Odysseus, you mean you're arguing against me on his behalf? Yes, that's what I mean. I did hate him when it was all right to hate. Why would you not walk all over him now that he's dead? Son of Atreus, do not take pleasure in advantages which are dishonorable. A mighty king does not show reverence all that easily. But he can give out honorable rewards to friends when they advise him prudently. A good man should obey those in command. Why not concede? You'll still be in control, although you let your friends prevail against you. Just remember the kind of man he was, the one for whom you want to do this favor. The man was an enemy of mine. 
That's true. But he was once a noble warrior. Why are you doing this? Why such respect for the dead body of an enemy? His excellence moves me to do it far more than his hostility to me. Men who act the way you're doing now are unreliable. Let me assure you, among human beings, most are changeable, sometimes friendly, then sometimes bitter. Are those the sort of men you'd recommend that we accept as friends? Well, I wouldn't recommend we choose someone inflexible. All right, but now you'll make us look like cowards. No, every Greek will think we're being just. So you would urge me to give my permission and let this corpse receive a burial? I would, for I myself will someday reach the state he's in as well. Well, there we have it. All men work to benefit themselves. For whom should I make such an effort if not for myself? We'll have to announce that you're the one responsible for this, not me. However you do it, it will serve to bring you several advantages. Well, in any case, you can rest assured I would grant you a greater favor than this burial. As for this man here, down in the underworld, he is my enemy, just as he was on Earth. But you can do whatever you think is appropriate. Memnon and his escort leave. Given how you have acted here today, Odysseus, any man who now asserts that you are not by nature wise is stupid. I now proclaim that from this moment on, I am Teucer's friend, as much as earlier I was his enemy. And I am willing to join him with burying the dead working with you and omitting nothing human beings may need to honor and respect their finest warriors. Noble Odysseus, I have nothing but praise for what you've said. You have done so much to disprove my fears. Of all the Argives, you were the one who was his greatest enemy, and yet you are the only one to stand by him, to lend a helping hand. For when he died and you were still alive, you could not bear to see such injuries inflicted on him, not like that frantic general who was here. He and his brother wanted their revenge by casting Ajax off without a grave. And so may our all-ruling father Zeus, high on Olympus, the unforgiving Furies and Justice too, who fulfills all things, destroy those evil men with evil deaths, just as they tried to rid themselves of Ajax, outrageous treatment he did not deserve. But you, child of venerable Laertes, I hesitate to let you touch the corpse in these funeral rites, for that may well offend the man who died. But as for all the rest, join in with us. If you wish, bring someone. Any soldier in the army will be welcome. I must get all things ready. Odysseus, you must know you've acted nobly for us. That's what I wished. But if you object to my participation here with you, I'll defer to what you want and leave. Odysseus leaves. Enough. Too much time has passed already. Hurry now. Some of you scoop out a hollow grave. Others set the cauldron high up on the stand with fire all around so we can start the ritual cleansing promptly. One of you bring from his hut the armor he would wear behind his shield. And you too, my child, since he's your father, use those loving arms with all the strength you have and help me lift him. His windpipe is still warm and from it flows his own dark spirit. Come then, come all of you who say you are our friends, come quickly, move out, and with your efforts, honor Ajax. There was no one to match his excellence. No nobler man has received such honor. I know of many things which mortal men can see and learn from, but until he meets it, no one sees what is to come or his own fate. They all leave, bearing the body of Ajax. 
Thank you for joining us this evening for Ajax by Sophocles. Um, we are going to take a short five minute break and then we invite you to join us back here for a discussion led by Dr. Laura Delosier. Thank you everyone so much.
Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for tuning in this evening. Um, I would like to introduce you all to Dr. Laura Delosier, who will be leading our discussion this evening. Hello. And let's have um, let's have everybody else. We can turn our, our videos back on. We have some audience members joining us also to participate in this discussion. And I will also be keeping track to um, of the comments and questions in the chat on Facebook, so we can address anything that you might be wondering as well. Um, but at this point, Laura, I'm just going to turn this over to you. Okay, thank you. Well, first off, I just want to thank Anne and the cast for this wonderful performance tonight. As I've mentioned in our rehearsal before, um, this is something that I live for to be able to see. And I think for those who like these tragedies to, to be reminded that they're supposed to be performed, they're supposed to be heard, they're not something just to be read and that there is so much meaning that comes from each of you bring this, this person to life again uh, in the play. And I thought I might um, start off and I was wondering, um, depending on how many people are able to join us here, were there any remaining questions that anyone had about the storyline before we go any further? That's, that's a great, and, and I should, I, I should mention, we do have a, about a 20 second delay okay. between, um, uh, what's going but maybe for for those for Allison, Landy, uh, Khalid, for all of those of you who are joining us and I know we have a couple more who are going to be joining us as well if um, if you have any questions um, as to what, what Laura was asking. Uh, I guess uh, what really interested me well the, uh, I jotted down a few things and I'm so upset because I had technical difficulties and lost the last 10 minutes or so, so darn. But um, I was really interested in the way women are portrayed in the play uh, because it seems almost as if they are there to bring in certain kinds of human qualities that are not there in the heroic male characters, the empathy, the, um, the, the concern about, gee, what's really going to be happening to my son and me? What is going to happen in real life? Not just these, um, this kind of mythical uh, heroism, this honor, all of this kind of thing. And um, I wondered if the women characters in a way make us really question the whole idea of heroism and honor in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, are you, are you including Athena there? Because when I think, you know, we have Athena and Tecmessa and I see so much of your words in Tecmessa, but I'm curious, do they apply to Athena too? No, no. I was thinking of human women, I guess. <laughs> okay. uh, no, because Athena definitely is someone, is something completely different there. And thank you for reminding me of that. I appreciate that. But yeah. And in fact, that's an interesting juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. And I think about that. So I'd be interested in your take on that. Well, I, I, I guess one way I would approach it is to say that uh, with Tech Mesa, I am um, one of the things I'm, I'm, I mentioned to the cast when we were in rehearsal is that it's really hard to hear her, to hear her voice and not hear the voices of other women who have been in her position in other Greek tragedies. And so, or going even back to the Iliad. So, in other words, sh there's a part of Andromache that you hear in a Tech Mesa, or um, there is a, a part. Of, of the women in the Trojan women by Euripides that you're hearing in her, a woman who's in a very difficult position. When you think of her relationship with Ajax, that she is his war prize, his ca war captive. And she makes this um, statement, which Issa gave so much life to after Ajax is dead, when she said, 
he no longer cares for me. There's a line in there where she had thought of it. And I, and it always strikes me as such a, it struck me there as she's saying it is a very strange thing to be saying under the circumstances, making you wonder about the nature of the relationships. And, and I guess we can, we can um, think of the, of the way when Ajax is alive that you saw that relationship being depicted and yet after he's dead, she's able to find this kernel of something that existed there before, something that there was in him to love. Though I guess I, I, could, um, I could ask Noelia, do, do you feel that Ajax has affection, genuine affection or love for Tecmessa? Ah, uh, this is a tough question. Um, I think that Ajax has love for Tecmessa when it's convenient for him. I think that he has love when he wants love. He has love when he wants to give love. Um, he wants love in the sexual sense. He appreciates that. Obviously, he picked her as his spoil of war, so um, he's at least sexually attracted to her. Um, and, you know, they did bear a son together. And so that has to offer some clout um, that she bore him an heir. Uh, but I think that my sense is that she, there's not love in, in the way that we think of it in the modern sense in an equal mm -hmm. sense or a um, respectful sense. I think he has no respect for her. He maybe has affection for her and, and love, you know, the way that you might love an animal who is yours, um, mm -hmm. that it brings you joy, but at the end of the day, it's yours and it's your property and it's yours to discipline and to, to treat as you will. And I don't really love myself for saying this stuff right now, but it's sort of my, my thought about it. I don't know. I mean, Issa, what do you think? Yeah. I think I would agree with that, with the convenience to him. Um, I think that Tech Mesa's love for him speaks a lot of how women were treated at that time of day, that he can treat her in that way. And that's just the way it is. And she accepts that. And she doesn't necessarily, until he kills himself, she doesn't take it as mm -hmm. an acknowledgement of how he feels about her. Because once he kills himself, he kind of damns her um and her son to a lot of uncertainty and a really hard life yeah. so and he I, does mention this which i find interesting like he mentions that this is going to be hard for her um but he also uh, he also mentions that you know this woman has changed my heart as a deception you know he mm -hmm. he so i don't know that we as the audience can trust that mm -hmm. you know, well, well his mentioning that his death will be hard on his woman that again has precedent going back to the Iliad I mean that's how Hector responds to him, to his wife's pleading there that's a, a lawfully wedded wife which is a, a significant distinction between a concubine taken as a war prize and yet it's the same vein of rhetoric of I recognize how my death will affect you and yet, and then dot, 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 that comes after. Um, and I guess um, with, with Issa, with your, with your character, were you, what do you think, it, what do you think are some of the reasons why, uh, to connect in with Allison is saying you're bringing humanity into the, into the plot, but at the same time, not ultimately being successful in persuading uh, Ajax. I think that goes back again to the way that, um, I, I don't know if she ever really had a chance of persuading him. Mm -hmm. I think she tried her best and made a lot of wonderful arguments as to why he shouldn't do what he was considering. I think that her speech to him is really lovely, but Ultimately, like Noelia said, he doesn't respect her. Mm -hmm. So how is he going to actually value what she says? Mm -hmm. That's what, that was what I would say. Mm -hmm. 
I see we have a, a question that came in from Facebook asking us to discuss how this performance responds to the theme of heroism and suffering as a form of disease. And, uh, and it, particularly in conjunction with this week's other performance of Ajax that was uh, done um, with reading Greek tragedy online. So that's a, that's a good place to take it about how, how this play is speaking. And um, perhaps to go with Odysseus, uh, Francesca, do you have a th thought since your character has this unique experience in the play, you're there at the beginning with Athena and Athena tells you it is a natural thing. It is a pleasurable thing to gloat over the failure of your enemy. And then you get to come back at the end, but I don't think you're gloating. No, I think, I think there's, um... And um, we spoke about this a little bit in rehearsal, this amazing manipulation that the gods seem to have over um, the people, um, the common man, um, or the not so common man, the hero, perhaps. Um, and I think temptation is a big part of that. Um, and I think what is potentially the reason why we are more human or more hero is when we resist temptation. And Odysseus could gloat, but I think um, respect has a lot to do with the reason why he doesn't. And I think he does see in himself a lot of Ajax. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and the fact that they were head to head. I mean, it, it's hard to, it, it's easy when you're in a competition and the person's two minutes slower than you mm -hmm. to say, I'm clearly the better choice. Um, but I think Ajax reveals a lot um, about why he was deserving of Achilles armor. And, and I think that Odysseus knows that. Um, and I think that there's something so interesting here, especially when it comes to this question of, of deserving um, or of, of sort of what, what makes a human count, what, what makes a man superior. Um, and we see this in so many different ways with this play. I, I mean, yesterday in the discussion from Reading Greek Tragedy Online, there was a lot of conversation about, um, about the characters um, of color, essentially the slaves of, of Teucer, of Tecmessa, um, mm -hmm. and of them being inferior. But I think that, um, and that was a phenomenal conversation, so I do highly recommend checking that out and, and um, tuning into that. Um, but I think that the, another thing that, that this play so, um, so interestingly highlights is this idea of a new man, um, of a man who, you know, we, we, we have, with the death of Achilles, we are fully entering this new age of man. It's no longer like the bravest, strongest warrior comes out on top. Achilles is gone, and now we have this chance to redefine mm -hmm who we want to be as a society. Like, what are the stories that we want to tell? Who are the role models that we want to uphold? And Odysseus is this thinker, this philosophizer, this, this rational human being who is, sees the value and worth of others and respects them to a degree as well. I mean, he doesn't say like, oh, Tusser, you don't want me to bury him? Well, screw you. He's like, I respect you for that. Okay, let me know if I can help, bye. Um, and I think that there's something really wonderful about that element of this play in, in sort of showcasing the potential of who, who we can be as a people. And I think that one of the interesting things Soph Sophocles does uh, in terms of who is getting the lines as well as who he puts as the chorus really mm -hmm. speaks to that. I think, you know, you look at who, 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 comprises a chorus and in this particular one it's the sailors and it's the everyday men and they're the ones who keep having the interjections to the audience talking about what they've given up and what they've sacrificed and all they want to do is go home and this is ridiculous um, and so I think when you're, when you're asking the question about heroes like yeah we have Ajax and we we have Agamemnon and Menelaus and Odysseus but we also have like Jack from 
pitchfork Wyoming who like really doesn't want to be here. Um, and so I think there's something really intriguing about what Sophocles is doing and that he didn't choose the great warriors to be the chorus. He didn't choose um, Agamemnon's people or Menelaus's people or or even like the the generals to be to be those who are speaking. He's he's asking just like the everyday people who were dragged over here mm -hmm. um, to to kind of voice to directly to the audience what's mm -hmm. what's going on and to kind of speak for against. I'm not really sure uh, what the war is and what what Athens for those who are watching in Athens at the time could be. I also think kind of going off of that, um, there's a, a lot of times, especially with contemporary film and theater, we see the action of the hero, um, but we don't watch Odysseus in action. We don't watch Ajax in action. We see Ajax in, tor in turmoil. Um, and I think, I think the action that we see Odysseus in is the heroic action and that's showing respect. Um, so I, I also think that's a very interesting tool that Sophocles used um, in terms of whose, whose story, story are we following and, and what action are we observing? What is the lesson here? Is it shock and awe and violence and the clear winner? Or is it the common man and their struggles? And um, absolutely well said. And I, and I just want to bounce off of that and, and sort of bring in a, um, a new question that um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring in my father here who has decided he doesn't <laughs> speak for himself, but he messaged me privately to say, um, my sense is that our views of heroism are vastly different than that of the Greeks. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm going to just give it to you, dad, because I, I don't have a good sense of what you mean by that, but I'm hoping that you can speak eloquently. <laughs> I don't know if I can speak eloquently or not, um, but uh, but what I remember from uh, from my uh, college courses on uh, on the ancient Greeks, uh, and we have a, a professor here, so this will be good. Um, but my sense of what I uh, learned was that um, the the Greek um, the Greek value or uh, how do I say it the Greek ideal of heroism was to be fearless in battle and uh and um and strong and and but the one major thing that ajax did not have was uh um respect for the gods um so so it would seem to me that uh that that um that in in our lives today in 2000 uh, 20. Uh, I don't know that uh, that that um, our culture values either of those two major planks of Greek uh, thought uh, the way that the Greeks did. Laura, do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, well, I don't know if I can resist. I'd be more curious on other people's opinions about our culture because I think there might be popular. Po different pockets of, of folks today in 2020 who might respond differently to that. I, I would say, yeah, that's a good summation of the way that Sophocles is presenting the situation. And it kind of connects to what Anne was saying about that there's some kind of cataclysmic change that's going to happen. Certainly the Trojan War, from a Greek perspective, is the ending of a great period of history, whichever kind of way they're talking about history. And there are multiple references that the Trojan War exists in part uh, as part of a divine plan by Zeus to create a, a, a conflict. He has two conflicts, one at Thebes and then one at Troy. And they're designed to essentially rid the world of the heroic children of the gods. And thus you will descend eventually, as Hesiod would say, to the Iron Age from the heroic age. And so that these heroes are working it, it, with a sense of what is their importance in battle. And it, certainly in this play, Athena, uh, as Ali is portrayed, uh, has said that this will be a consequence if you do not respect us. And then uh, Corinne had with the messenger brought that back too, telling us a very important point that this man did not listen to his father's words of advice about 
how to relate to the gods. And we know that his father, Telamon, was successful at Troy once before. And so the father has set an example that two sons are attempting to live up. Um, I, I'm struck by the way that both sons are terrified about coming home to their father. And so if you want to say about the suffering of a hero or the place of a hero, uh, that shadow of Telamon is being cast very strongly in this play of how it is affecting at least two men's lives. And I would make an argument also Tecmessa's life that she's being pulled into a pattern that she is like Teucer's mother uh, and is hoping to maybe at least have some of the benefits that Teucer's mother enjoyed also as a war captive from Troy who was taken back uh, by Telamon and gave birth to a son. For the initial audience of Sophocles, I would say yes, that, that part of what you said would also apply. Sophocles was a general. Uh, when he presented this play, about four to 6,000 individuals could watch it. The bulk of those would have been citizens who are either active military or veterans. And that to, to have accomplishments in war uh, that could be bragged about or that would be to the benefit of your state was good. But what was very peculiar about Athens is you also had to justify what you did. So commanders at the end, every elected official at the end of their year in office had to justify what they did while in office. And if your justification was not accepted, you were you could be uh, face a series of different kinds of uh, consequences for the citizens not accepting what you had done. Uh, let me uh, let me um, ask you uh, for the benefit of uh, maybe others and maybe me. Um, the 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 great panoply of these uh, um, Argive generals uh, um, or leaders. Um, of which we see Agamemnon, we see Odysseus, we see uh, uh, Menelaus, and we see, uh, uh, we hear of Achilles and so on. Of, of all of those, um, can you briefly um, say the fate of, of them, uh, of what happened, you know, what happened? I mean, well, we already know that Achilles was killed. Yeah, he, he's dead. Uh, there, it's a, it's, well, he is, he's dead. He's dead before the action begins. He's actually also the first cousin of Ajax. So whenever Ajax, you know, whenever Noelia is, is making a reference back to him and, and using him as a standard, it's sort of the shadow of Telamon and the shadow of the fact that this is the son of my father's brother and my first cousin that I've always had to be second to while we've been here at Troy. Um, in, in the case of, of Tecmessa, we're not really quite certain what happens to her after this, unfortunately. Her son, at least, will go on, go back to, to the island of Salamis and be accepted by Telamon and will get to be king. And he will eventually become a cult figure in Athens uh, that is a uh, uh, received cult and be associated with Athens. So, so Tecmessa at least ha will achieve for her son a better future, the future that she maybe wanted, that he will be recognized as the heir of his father because there are, there's nobody else who can, who can claim that position and the grandfather will accept him. Um, Odysseus is going to be wandering uh, for 10 years after the war, but will eventually have to get home after facing a few problems at home first um, that require, <laughs> require slaughtering most of his neighbor's sons. And it will be Athena that prevents him from being killed by the neighbors who aren't very happy about the slaughtering of the sons. Um, Teucer uh, will face exactly what he was afraid of. He, he can't, his father won't let him come home. His father banishes him uh, for not coming back with the brother Ajax. And he will end up, uh, according to Ripides and Ripides one play, Helen, he'll end up in Egypt and he is on his way to Cyprus. He's come for advice uh, and he will be successful on Cyprus of establishing his own kingdom there. And there's further stories that he will try when his father is dead to come home, but his nephew uh, will not be accepting of him, but he at least will find a new Salamis on Cyprus. So he will, as it were, create his own new world on that island. 
Um, Agamemnon will be slaughtered when he arrives home. He'll come home with his own war captive and his wife and his first cousin will take vengeance on him. They both have <laughs> reasons is how I'll put it, uh, based on previous history, including killing a daughter and killing brothers uh, in the family a generation before. A Menelaus and Agamemnon, they, their family has many problems uh, of revenge. Um, Menelaus will eventually, there are various stories, uh, one is that he will also end up in Egypt where he discovers Helen was never at Troy and he will pick up the real Helen and they will get to go home and be happy together. But in other versions of the story, they just go straight home from Troy and they will be successful rulers again in Sparta. And when they die, both of them will get to go to the Isle of the Blessed. So they have the best outcome in the life to come after their mortal life. Um, and as far as the messenger, well, <laughs> we're not quite certain, uh, except for there are so many other uh, plays which depend on a messenger being the person who brings critical evidence. So that's um, Odysseus and Menelaus, I would say are the, uh, and Teucer are represent different kinds of men who are successful. And, in, and this might, if I could segue to another question, might lead to wondering then, since those are the men we know or the characters who are going to be successful in this world that is coming after the Trojan War, I'm curious, is there anything valid in the actions of Menelaus and maybe even Agamemnon, but at least of Menelaus in this, in what he says, is there any validity in anything he's saying? Yeah. And, yeah. I don't know. Claire says yes. And I, I would yes. like her to. I would like her to expand <laughs> well, upon Claire, that. Claire, yes. Could you explain why? I say yes. Um, I I think one of the really it was striking me today while listening to it. Uh, but I feel like Menelaus seems pretty clearly set up to be the foil, but then if one reads what he's saying, especially through a sort of more contemporary light, um, there's a, a lot of, of really important points that I think we um, we maybe don't grasp onto quite as quickly because Ajax is our, our protagonist. But I mean, you know, he, he tried to, to slaughter Menelaus and Agamemnon and he thought he was killing them even though he was killing animals. Um, and he was mad because he lost uh, competition and he was like yes I know I shall kill people to to be better um and I, I suppose it it it's one of those interesting things for me in that I suppose it depends on your positionality and your your cultural context and for Menelaus and, and Agamemnon this society is one in which adherence to the gods is crucial and Ajax is flouting that uh, in, a, in a pretty big way. And I mean, they're, they're in battle. And so if one of your generals is going against your rule, then it, it, we see in common warfare that that's, you know, court martial at best. Um, and so I think while Sophocles, I, I don't necessarily think is, ac is agreeing. Um, I would say for me personally, I think there's, there's a lot of truth and a lot of interest in what Menelaus and Agamemnon are saying and just because we're seeing it through the eyes of people who hate them doesn't mean that what they're saying is any less valid um, nor does their their position and, and how they're seeing what's going on um, become discounted because Ajax killed himself. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question like following off on that? Mm -hmm. So I know in a lot of modern religions a burial is a very important part of like as going to heaven or the afterlife and it it's a part of kind of respecting God is making sure that you're dead or buried. Uh, is that the same in the Greek religion? So would they be disrespecting the gods by not offering him a burial then? Is that a hypocrisy kind of thing? It's, it's twofold. So yes, it can be taken as a disrespect of a divine law. And that's Sophocles' big uh, concern in the Antigone, which is another play that probably dates from the same decade, maybe within just a couple of years of this play, that is the 440s BCE. Uh, so yes, but more importantly, if you don't give a proper burial to the dead, they will never rest properly in the underworld. 
So you are condemning them to an eternity of restlessness. And that restlessness will include that they start losing contact with the living. They'll start forgetting who they are. Um, if you desecrate a body, that's, that's part of why the treatment of Hector is so heinous, uh, that if you are desecrating the body before burial, then the person in the afterlife will have to bear those wounds and injuries into the afterlife. And what you always risk with the dead um, is that if they lose understanding and contact with the living, if cult is not regularly performed on an annual basis to the dead, then they can become dangerous spirits that can harm the living. So it can come back and ultimately hurt you, uh, whether it's you personally who denied them or your people, your community could be hurt by these spirits that cannot rest at peace. So yes. Dani or uh, Alex, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on your character's sense of self and sense of right purpose in what you were saying in the play. Yeah, um, I definitely yesterday during the reading um, focused, or not yesterday, excuse me, uh, Tuesday when we were doing rehearsal, um, mm -hmm. I focused on the play as a whole. And then today I focused on me and my part as an actor and focused mm -hmm. in on my part. And even when things were going on, I was going over my lines, making sure I pronounced things correctly. So I got a, a really good sense of uh, what Menelaus was saying, and I, I completely agree with what Claire said, um, that at first when I had read through this um, and we did the read through on Tuesday, I was kind of like, oh, they're kind of just like spitballing things at each other, like Menelaus and Tucer. And then as I went through it again today, and as I went through it yesterday on my own to prep, I was like, oh, wow, Ajax was kind of a jerk to like these, these guys. And like, and again, with what Claire said, with um, how the play is is um, talking about Ajax as the hero and like it's Ajax's story, but that doesn't mean that there's not something valid in like the villains of the story. Um, and so I could, yeah, I completely agree. And I think that like Ajax was kind of a jerk and I think Menelaus and Agamemnon have a right to be kind of pissed about it. Um, maybe not like so pissed as like, let's let his body never get rest. Like that's kind of harsh, but, but you know, I think that they, they have a right to be pissed and yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I was inclined to at first just really like Tucer because he's mm -hmm. uh, funny and uh, really can hold his own in that battle of wits. And I mm -hmm. loved that. Um, but yeah, same. I, you know, we did the read through on Tuesday and that was just a lot of me figuring out like the sarcasm and that, we could have fun with that part. Um, but then, yeah, rereading it and just thinking about it over yesterday and today. Um, I mean, even when he shows up, like he he's very sad, but immediately it's what will happen to me? Like, look, you had to just go and die. And now all of my stuff is messed up. And I didn't really realize that until today. Like he never is like, oh, I'm gonna miss you. We had a great time <laughs> together. He's just immediately woe is me and um and that just made me like obviously there are a couple times when he he has you know his like sources he can cite times that Ajax did all these things <laughs> to argue with Menelaus and Agamemnon but like he picks very specific little bits of their argument to argue against he never acknowledges or like defends Ajax's actions he's never like no what he did was fine he shouldn't be punished he just is like well you said this thing so I'm gonna argue with that um, and I just, I didn't really notice that until today. And I just find him a little more, uh, selfish than I originally did. Um, <laughs> sorry, I mean, I feel like everyone that is, that is connected to Ajax in Alliance, essentially, then bemoans his death with the phrase, Alas, they are literally mourning for the loss of Ajax, but that then goes on to like, alas for me. Everyone brings it back to the woe that is brought upon themselves. Um, but I think that that also speaks a little bit to Odysseus's line with um, the, the, um, the back and forth with Agamemnon, where uh, ultimately he says like, well, 
if nobody else looks out, like, shouldn't I, shouldn't I be looking out for myself? Like, mm-hmm. why not? Like, that's a sane, rational thing to do. And it speaks to something of the peculiar nature of the command structure, um, and because Agamemnon is not king of them all. Each of these are individual kings who have brought their own forces and they've agreed to have Agamemnon as commander in chief, but it's always a kind of very tenuous um, agreement to abide by him. It really has to be a working out of a consensus is what you're hearing. Uh, I think this might be a, a nice place to transition to another question we had off from Facebook which was asking about Ajax's death. And it gets to your point about how this play doesn't stop with the suicide, right? The climactic moment really is not just suicide and then that's it, curtain, that this play goes on and you get to find about the impact of his death. And our question is, uh, who's responsible for that death of Ajax? Is it Athena who was conniving and cruel or Ajax while unstable uh, chose to maintain his honor through suicide? So I guess it would be nice to turn to our Athena first and to ask her, when you are, are looking at your character, what culpability do you feel Athena has for this suicide? Um, just like, um, just thinking about the name alone and, and the little description you give, she is the goddess of war and wisdom. Mm-hmm. So everything she does is calculated it's made on purpose she has strategy well equipped with strategy just um everything she does is is kind of teetering on like this entire like sorry what is it the cards that are just kind of all going to fall down at some point they're going to land in the spot that she wants it um i mean i was kind of thinking while we were talking she's kind of like this um person the puppeteer over a chessboard uh, she knows her opponents, but she also knows her own players. So I was thinking that uh, she will put these things in place and she will probably have a great idea about how uh, those puppets will handle those situations. She knows their weaknesses, she knows their strengths. So of course she's manipulating this um, situation. She's showing um, Ajax these visions and she's telling that him that these uh, people he wants to kill are in the field and he is going to do with that what he wants. Um, I believe that she told him that initially though because once he's turning on his fellow man, once he's turning on his own uh, people, she's like, well, you can't be in this war anymore. You're not with your men. You're not with us. So therefore I am not with you. And so I will put you in this situation so that you can figure out where you stand and you're gonna, you know, make the cards fall to where you ended up to be and what you made it to be. Um, And I think that she puts a lot of tests up for all the other men, uh, especially with Odysseus, to be like, look, this happened. And if you make the wrong choice and you decide to make the chessboard fall in a a similar way, Mm -hmm. the gods will come after you as well. So I feel that she is kind of placing all these strategies out there and she knows what could eventually happen, what will eventually happen. Um, But it's also kind of fun for her, I think, to play um, with their decision making. Definitely, yeah. Noelia, did you think of Ajax as unstable? Um, Yes, I think I'd like to, um, this is a total repeat of something that was said in yesterday's discussion, but I do think it's important to mention that this play is often um, used uh, as a treatment for those who are stuff suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Stress disorder. Um, and we can kind of see why, like here is this war hero who has now come home mm-hmm. and yet, it's not the war that kills him. It's, it's the after effects. It's, it's, Mm -hmm. um, it's everything that happens in his mind afterwards. Um, and so, yes, in this, um, play, you know, and, and when it was written, I don't know the context, but, you know, in sort of a modern Mm -hmm. sense, um, Athena serves as, as bad memories and, and, 
the bad things that happen after war. I'm not a veteran. I have immense respect for those who are, but I just can only imagine how um, destructive that can be. And so I do think that Ajax is unstable and perhaps I think that Athena was the catalyst mm -hmm. for the destruction, but ultimately in the end, every person makes their own decision. I don't know if that lines up with what the Greeks would say um, or you know what the philosophy is, but um, yeah. Can, can I just add, this is a, um, a sort of non sequitur, but I just a context question for you, doctor. Um, what year of the Trojan War was this play and then how long after did this play did Troy fall? Uh, well, we should be uh, we should be in the last year of the war because okay. that's uh, uh, when the Iliad dies. That's uh, right before this because Achilles is still alive, and then he's going to get shot by Paris to you know in in his heel, which was the one part his mother held him, and mm -hmm. so that's where he can find that's the one part that he can be killed at, and so it's they have. Um, we are, we are literally just concluded the funeral games for for Achilles because that's maybe part of what's factoring in here about what kind of burial a hero should have is, mm -hmm. is you should have a, about a week or so of celebrations and competitions and prizes having been given out to to celebrate the the life that has just passed and it is sort of we have just finished burying Achilles because we've just decided somehow in those games, presumably the decision about the armor and it is gone of Achilles and it has gone um, to Odysseus. And of course, what makes this armor so special is it's not just mortal armor, it's armor made by Hephaestion, the God of the forge uh, that um, Thetis brought for her son. So the point is you have divinely made armor and you can see why it's, it's an incredible prize because who else is going to get armor made by a god right. and so that's that's where this play opens it should be you know the embers are just burning from that celebration so to speak well and that's a piece of it too right that that the gods are also sort of at war with mm -hmm. troy and so these people are are pawns for them and so maybe we'll give you know this person this piece of armor or um i i really am not super up to history up you know, on my Greek mythology or Greek history, but um, mm -hmm. is that correct that the, the gods are sort of yeah no they 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 take different sides uh, and it goes back to the judgment of Paris uh, where he judged between three goddesses um, Aphrodite and Athena um, and Hera and he had an apple which said to the fairest or and he awarded the prize to Aphrodite who had promised him the most beautiful woman in the world who at that time was the one daughter of Zeus who was immortal and sexually available. And that was Helen of Sparta at that time who was married to Menelaus. And the apple, I mean, everything keeps going and going and going because the apple is there because it comes from the wedding feast of Peleus and Thetis. So Achilles' parents, when they got married, had a wedding where mortals and immortals were invited except for they didn't invite discord because who would invite the goddess discord to a wedding so she got even with the apple so it is this sort of spiraling so you're right in pointing out how everyone's lives here are interwoven and it's a it's like a big coil in which you're bound but at the same time you still have to take action to make things happen so it's not just that you have a fate and it's going to happen to you regardless of what you do. Um, and it's it's why maybe the messenger is such a bittersweet speech that Corinne has because there is that, Kalka says, there's that tiny possibility this guy can be saved if you keep him inside his tent today and he doesn't leave. And, it, and, and, and I guess the idea is that, you know, Athena's wrath will abate because that's another thing about the gods. They're not always consistent. They, they whirl through emotions just like humans. And that is why maybe with, with Corinne, she's so sad in delivering her message because realizing that she's just missed him. So if it's a nick of time situation that if she had just gotten here a little bit earlier that this could have been stopped. Laura, I wanna go back to, to this question from Facebook about um, 
uh, about the culpability or who is responsible for Ajax's death and particularly Athena's role in this. Um, while I am not familiar with these, I remember hearing that there are other versions or other tellings of Ajax where Ajax commits suicide while still sort of under the thralls of Athena. Um, and so I do think that that's something, I'm not sure, again, this is something I heard, so I can't cite it, but I do think it's interesting that, um, that in Sophocles' version, we have him come to lucidity yeah. prior to electing to take his own life. And I think that that's a really interesting um, distinction that, that goes back to, to what Noelia was saying in terms of, you know, it's, it's his own mind ultimately and his memories that, that mm -hmm. bring him down. Mm -hmm. um, I would say yes, that that's uh, de definitely a very important distinction here is that he's no longer in his madness. His madness, at least in this play, as, as Athena describes it to um, Odysseus, is limited to the killing of the animals, uh, to mistake them for the Greek forces. He's, he's basically killing the booty that was supposed to be divided up, the spoils of war that were supposed to be divided up amongst all the soldiers. So in part, part of the reason why Menelaus and then later Agamemnon are coming and are so upset is he's basically taken away what was gonna be their prizes of war. And then there's the re secondary realization, oh wait, that was, he was thinking that was us. So somehow they've been told presumably by Odysseus what the, the truth of the situation is and that it's not just a man taking vengeance on, on you through animals, but that it was the goddess that come in and intervened in that fashion. But, but in this play, he is presented as being cognizant at the moment of his suicide. It's, it ends and everything he says after that, his interactions with um, Tecmessa are, are no longer uh, under the influence of divinely inspired madness. I think that's a powerful tool used in a few stories. I think immediately of Agave mm -hmm. and how that veil is dropped before she realizes what she's done in ripping her son's head from his body. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a, it's a really useful tool. Um, I think uh, the choice to then take action or have remorse for action um, presents itself in a really uh, exposing way for that character, and um, and I I also um, kind of going back to what Noelia was saying, and also one of the first questions asked about heroism. Mm -hmm. um, I think in contemporary battle, you have fallen heroes. And I think there is something in death that is heroic. And uh, certainly that's how we try to perceive it because I think it's a good coping mechanism, mm -hmm. if not anything else. Um, I, I mean, it, it's also respectful, um, but uh, I, I just think it's, uh, just interesting that all of these things are now layering and this moment where Ajax does decide to commit suicide um, with his clear mind. Uh, what, what exactly does that moment reveal to him and how does that also help us see clearly? Are you asking me? You're asking the <laughs> Yes. Yes. Hard questions, Francesca. <laughs> oh man. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Oh man. Oh. I mean, I. I think. Oh, okay. So, all right. One second. I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna pull up the speech because now I feel like I gotta. <laughs> I gotta actually look at this. So one. <laughs> one second. While I. Pull up this speech. Somebody else should should talk while I'm doing that. Well, I guess um, maybe even talking to Athena. Um, what would your perspective be if if you had had control still 
over him? What do you think that Athena wants him to, to kill himself? Or what do you think her goal is? Or as a goddess is the joy of her role, the, the fact that these humans can, can, in a way, control their own fate? It's, it's kind of hard thinking as like the separation of being a deity and, and, and being like a human, like, cause she's so playful with everyone. She has this like, this ability. And it's so hard to think like how uh, deeply you can bring her back to being a human and how, how far you can drag her back to being like, oh, these people. Um, because I mean with Athena's character there's so many debates about how she's treated people in the past like with Medusa um you know she went to her altar and and then uh as someone who was violated and then Athena like had all this Medusa ended up dead you know like she's on she's on the shield of Athena so it's it's very hard to think like oh will she bring this humanity back for this one person um will her rage counteract at some point uh, because I think she truly is um, just so enraged, so mad that that she spent so much time making sure that this war would be won, um, guiding all of these people, just so that this one character would suddenly, you know, be mad about armor. You know, of course he has the reasons to, but she's like, how could you be mad about this? And um, well, that and, she, and that he's taking the credit for himself and discrediting her. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like she. she I think she's really upset that she. Yeah. Uh, this. Uh, oh, did see Ajax fought with these men, won with these men, and then somehow after winning this long battle, wants to turn against them. So I feel like it's really hard for Athena to make him this like human being and feel his sadness and feel his sorrow and be like, you know what? No, no, no. I don't want you to die. So it's like this weird balance, I feel. Mm -hmm. um, now that I have the speech up, <laughs> thank you for that brief pause. Um, I guess what I'm, what I'm looking at and what I'm struck by in this final speech of Ajax is that number one, he's not interested in dying alone. He's asking for um, death to be there with him. He's asking, he's, he's saying, well, I'll converse with you afterwards, but then he's, he's looking for some connection with something else after. Um, he's talking to Hermes. He's talking to basically everybody he can, looking for some sort of connection. Um, and he also is feeling venge vengeful in, in these last moments that, mm -hmm yeah, I'm gonna die because this is what I need to do for honor. Um, and maybe, I, I don't know um, if suicide was thought of as it is today. Maybe it was thought of differently back then and um, I'd love to hear about that. But but my thought is that he's, he's killing himself for honor, but also that to everybody else who has screwed him um, or who he blames, that they better get theirs too. If I'm gonna do this, um, then they better get theirs. And also um, this thought that I think still resonates today that whatever happens to you after death, that you don't want your body, you want your body to be taken well care of or, or treated respectfully. Um, and so he is, you know, he's asking like, please just let my friends see me first. Um, so I don't know, those are just sort of my thoughts on, on that. Can I riff off that really quick and the idea of honor? Um, I think that the biggest difference between Tecmessa and the rest of the characters, and I think maybe even for the everyday man, this is sort of the same idea, is how do we consider what honor is? Because she says to him, honor your father, honor me, honor our son, keep living for us. But Ajax his whole, and I think a lot of them have this mindset that honor is about how you die and how people viewed you as you lived. And he can't stomach the idea that he could die at the hands of these other men. Mm. And so in order to preserve his honor, he dies on his sword. And I think that kind of, and he says, even in that speech, like I pity her and he thinks about what she said to him, but he can't separate his mind from what honor is to him. 
And so I think that's an interesting thing that kind of still is pervasive in society today and how men consider honor versus how uh, like women consider honor and how that affects the way that we treat each other and what our actions are. So I think that's kind of what it revealed to him and what it can reveal to us. I think it also allows us to ask the question, what can we live with? Mm -hmm. Whether that is shame or honor. And sorry to cut you off, Laura. Oh, no, no, that's okay. No, that's really good. Because I was just going to say that um, uh, that there's, a, again, a precedent for, for how uh, you were presenting the question of honor and how Tecmessa is seeing it versus how he's seeing it and maybe even how Tusser is seeing it and how certainly his, um, the two brothers, uh, uh, the sons of Atreus are seeing it, is that there, there is this ancient or older precedent going back to the Iliad again when Andromache tries to do the same thing Texmessa is doing it. Hector has to have his death. And he understands, on one hand, he seems to understand how terrible her life is going to be although he has a bit of myopia that he thinks his son will somehow survive this situation. But nonetheless, though he can envision a horrible fate in the fall of his city because he sees himself as upholding his city, he's still willing to let a whole entire city perish so he can have the death that brings with him the fame and the, and the respect afterwards that he wants, the glory he wants after his life. So that's really some really good points to um, bring out. The one thing I would just, add about the question about suicide. Um, suicide is not against the religion in this world. So if you're thinking the deities, any of the deities have commanded mortals that they must live, and that is somehow a great crime to commit suicide. Uh, uh, from the gods perspective, no, they, they don't care. Really, they really don't. Um, now from the community, there's not to the best of my knowledge, I know of no law at Athens forbidding suicide. Um, they, they have at, at different Greek communities have at different points accepted moments when suicide can occur. And it is when your back is up against a wall of some kind, whether it's a physical or metaphysical one. But when you are in a situation where you feel that this is the only viable alternative for you to save your situation, and that can be very broadly defined, then yes, suicide is an acceptable alternative to living with disgrace. I mean, the classic example um, from the Mediterranean cultures would be, do you wish to be captured in war or do you wish to commit suicide? And it's better to die free than live a slave according to that, to that logic. So in that sense, um, his suicide is for him to rationalize out in, in the situation and you've all in, in your own ways have been mentioning reasons why however much he might be suffering the trauma of war, he is nonetheless making to himself a logical argument about why he's taking this course of action. And, it's, and, and realizing somewhat at least its potential ramifications on a, a wide range of people, um, including potentially those he, he speaks less of, like, such as the commanders in chief. That is, Ajax is, is famous. I mean, it's what Alex's character, Tusser says. Ajax was the one who pitched his camp in the least defensible position. So he took the hardest place to hold his men. Ajax was the one in battle who would also take the more dangerous positions in battle. So by removing himself from those situations, somebody else is going to have to take now those places to keep the camp safe and furthermore to go into battle and take those more dangerous um, posts in battle. I also see a parallel between Ajax and Sophocles as well um, and thinking about how when Sophocles was asked to defend himself for corrupting the youth and asking questions and, and, and going against authority, he was given so many outs but he chose suicide. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, a lot of conversations about why he would do that. And one of the things that really struck me listening to, to the Ajax speech tonight was that idea of, as you said, back against the wall, but then also who will take up the mantle. And I think sometimes there's a way in which that form of suicide, that form of martyrdom leads to your position, your ideology being carried on in a way that it wouldn't have otherwise. If Ajax remained this kind of like, 
kind of crazy guy who killed a bunch of the spoils of war, his legacy isn't going to continue then. He's, it's going to be marred. But by taking his life, he then spars all of his followers forward, not unlike Sophocles, and that they both are asking that kind of central question of who gets to be in charge and why. And then their followers take that up and, and continue it on, both fictionally and historically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's been a uh, uh, there's a lot of comments about that Socrates was creating some kind of legalized form of suicide with the way he gave his answers at his trial. Yeah, to create that. We have another um, uh, question that's come in that I, I think it would be really nice to address. So for those who are unfamiliar with Greek tragedy, at the time this play was first produced, there were either two or possibly three speaking actors plus a chorus. So actors would have been all um, males uh, who were wearing masks so that they could rapidly change between characters. So in some sense, the actor who's playing Ajax may have been also the actor who ended up playing Teucer, for example. And it makes this interesting thought of the connections that could go between. The question we have is about those masks that uh, actors would have worn in the past, and then the way that you're presenting the material um, tonight. And um, it's asking, do, do you feel as actors that you are placing more emphasis on the, the language and the voice acting rather than the face acting uh, in what you uh, have to do for the reading tonight? Did you have a sense of masking or taking on an easily identifiable persona while focusing very much on the spoken language. And maybe- I oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I can say something to that. I, um, um, because as my character doesn't come in for at least the first hour, if not hour 15, um, I spent, you know, that first period of time getting into character and I made sure that when I turned my camera on, my face was not Danny's face anymore. Mm -hmm. It was Menelaus's face and I like was really conscious about that um, and keeping the face, especially with um, virtual theater and kind of where we're where the world is headed right now um like this box is all i get like i'm as you can see because my hands are moving right now <laughs> um i really i'm a huge like i talk with my hands i'm a huge like body talker but i had my script and i had to keep scrolling and i had to not use my hands because it would be super distracting so i was confined to like the really small box of the screen and so basically all you guys can see is my face um so i I tried to to use my face, especially in those moments of like when um, Alex's Tucer had those like long speeches while I was still, you know, on stage. Um, how would I react? Because I still have to react because the audience can still see me and they can see me arguably way closer than if I was on stage. So this is kind of more in that vein of like the really like the close ups of like the film and TV acting, which a lot of us theater people are not super trained for, so it's kind of scary, but I, I definitely put on a mask as soon as, you know, I heard my name being called that the characters were seeing me coming. I put the face on, turned on the camera and really tried to consciously like keep it until the camera was off. And then I like relaxed in my chair and became Danny again. So I totally did the masking without a physical mask, so. Yeah. For me, uh, when, when I do mask work, and sort of the way I was trained to do mask work is that it becomes a very physical art form. And I would, I would maybe argue that in a way the mask work lends to perhaps just as much emphasis on the physicality as it does on the language. And there's something in which, especially at chorus face, because choral is kind of slightly different um, in terms of, of how it is acted. And not being able to have that mask and not have the the very stylistic movements that come with mask work led to kind of an interesting conundrum of how do you do that like how how do you still have the essence if not like the actual uh role and so one of the things i found myself really thinking about was what i would be doing with my body if i had a mask could i do that with parts of my face 
Um, and so then it becomes language based, of course, that's the number one. Um, and then the second would be, you know, like the, the way one might move the, the tilt of the head, the move, like, because you can't see my face. Can you do that with an eyebrow? Can you do that with a face muscle? Can you do that with a cheek? Um, so if I was kind of thinking a lot about what I was trained to do with my body and then how do you do that with your face? Cause you can't do it with your body. Um, well, of course, always keeping the language front and center. <laughs> Um, as a as a physical theater specialist, um, the mask is really important because it liberates both the voice and the body um, for storytelling. And if you look at where, um, and you know, fortunately, having been to ancient Messini and performed on ancient grounds, you understand just how important it would have been for the chorus to have been a collective sound maker, mm -hmm. just so the sound would have carried. Um, mm -hmm. uh, across a huge audience and quite a large space. Um, so uh, it's, it's difficult to do that um, through virtual um, medium, um, though I really do appreciate what uh, Danny said. I think there's incredible intricacies which then make this stylized for more traditional Greek theater. Um, that we abandoned um, for the sake of effectively um, communicating this story on this medium. Um, so yeah, masking, I mean, it was remarkable. I mean, and you also have to think about these huge pieces of scenery that they would have been pushing across these almost railroad tracks, you know, um, and how effective it would have been to hear the like moan of anybody encountering someone who's just died or the corpse and, and how it feels very strange because this relationship we have with the camera is so intimate and you're like, yes, I, Ah, like it's it's a battle so i mean huge kudos to both um noelia and isa for their ability to harness that in such a strange space um but yeah i think that you know ultimately the mask is a is a tool for liberation of the actor there's a lot to hide behind and i think it's it's absolutely right that the actor can then without the mask utilize um the physical and the facial and vocal and verbal um, tools to communicate. Mm -hmm. Did anyone have any other comments about how they felt about presenting and masking for the camera? Yeah, I have a thought. Um, may maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I remember studying that the mask is actually built so that it's a microphone. Uh, internally so that people can be, uh, characters can be heard throughout the entire audience. And that's also why, you know, we have the, uh, the raking system so we can have a natural sound system in um, ancient times. So um, I think storytelling has been dated since this, you know, since these times. Um, they're finding ways of how to tell a story, how to tell a story well, how to entertain people, how to teach people. And I think, you know, over time and over the mediums we've been given, especially now in this specific time, we have to use what we're given. Um, and so right now we can't be given lots of space. We can't be given uh, background settings. We can't be given masks because it, would, it wouldn't serve the purpose well for this specific medium. So what we have is our faces and our voice. Luckily, you know, we have the technology to hear clearly without strain and hear clearly without force and push, but we have face and it's very close, it's very clear, it's very crisp. So I think, I think, you know, the mask idea is still there. The storytelling is we are using these things so that our audience can see us. So that if you carry that idea it's still a mask, it's just a different way, just the way storytelling is much different than it was way back then. We evolve, we adapt, but the voice lives. <laughs> I think that's actually a really beautiful note to end on. Laura, did you have anything else that you wanted to, to share? To, to thank you and the actors for your wonderful performances tonight.
Thank you all so much. Thank you, Laura, for leading this discussion. Thank you to Claire, to Eileen, Alex, Francesca, Danny, Noelia, Corinne, and Issa, as well as Jay, who she had, they, they had to take off. Um, but, um, and also a big thank you to our community members who joined us for this discussion. Thank you to Allison, to Landy, Ron, and Khalid. Thank you guys. We, um, we're going to be taking a break from virtual programming for a few weeks at Relative Theatrics. No, 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 this is a good, this is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Not for me on the other side. Yes, <laughs> it's been a lot of work and, and oh, geez, we had our, our, first, <laughs> our like, first technical glitch in nine weeks that of course, it just had to happen tonight. So thank you all for bearing with us. Um, but we will be coming back on um, June 25th for another Greek reading in conjunction with Reading Greek Tragedy Online. We will be reading Hecuba. So taking a look at the Trojan War from the other side of the ramparts, um, from inside the walls of Troy. And so if you would like to be a part of our discussion in the Zoom call for the discussion component, please let me know because we would love to have you. And it's so fun to even, even, even though we're all in our own homes. Claire, you are making this very hard for me right now. <laughs> even though we're all in our own homes, it is a, a small way that we can feel like as a community, we are still gathering and and just to, to see the familiar faces of our relative theatrics family to be a part of these conversations uh, really means a lot. So um, thank you all so much for tuning in and we'll see you next month. En enjoy the wonderful weather that is coming to our way here at Laramie and enjoy life if you are not here. And tune in for the Wednesday Reading Greek Tragedies Online. Um, they're awesome. So you get little excerpts, lots of discussion, 90 minutes, short, sweet, thought-provoking, wonderful. Um, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful night. Let's stop this. <laughs> <laughs>